Section 60 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by D. Randall. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha Von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 14, Part 5. Meanwhile, Dr. Bressa had arrived. He himself brought the medicines which we had telegraphed for. I could have kissed his hands as he walked into the midst of us to devote his self-sacrificing services to his old friends. He at once took on himself the command of the establishment. He had the two corpses carried into a remote chamber, barred up the rooms in which the poor things had died, and made us all submit to a powerful disinfecting process. An intense carbolic odor now penetrated all the rooms, and to this day, whenever this smell meets me, those dreadful days of cholera rise before my imagination. The intended flight had to be postponed a second time. On the very day of Lily's death, the carriage was standing ready which was to convey away Aunt Mary, Rosa, Otto, and my little boy, when the coachman, seized by the invisible destroyer, was forced to get off the coach box again. Then I will drive you, said my father, when the news was brought to him. Quick, is everything ready? Rosa came out. Drive on, she said, but I must stop behind. I am going Lily's way. And she spoke truth. The break of day dawned on this second young bride, too, in the chamber of death. Of course, in the horror of this new calamity, the departure of the others was not carried out. In the midst of my anguish, of my raging fear, the deepest scorn again seized me for that gigantic folly which had voluntarily called forth so great a calamity. My father, when Rose's corpse had been carried out, had sunk on his knees with his head against the wall. I went to him and took him by the arm. Father, I said, this is war. No answer. Father, do you hear? Now or never will you now curse war? He, however, collected himself. You remind me of it. This misfortune shall be borne with a soldier's courage. It is not I alone. The whole country has to offer its sacrifice of blood and tears. What comfort then has come to the country from the sufferings of you and your brethren? What comfort from the lost battles? What from these two girls' lives cut short? Father, oh, do me this kindness for the love of me. Curse war. See here. I drew him to a window, and just then a black coffin was being brought on a car into the courtyard. See here? That is for our Lily, and tomorrow another such for our Rosa, and the day after, perhaps a third. And why? Why? Because God has willed it so, my child. God, always God. All that, however, is folly, all savagery, all the arbitrary action of men hiding itself under the shield of God's will. Do not blaspheme, Martha. Do not blaspheme now when God's chastening hand is so visibly. A footman came into the room. Your Excellency, the carpenter will not carry the coffin into the chamber where the countesses are lying, and no one will venture into it. Not you either, coward? I could not alone. Then I will help you. I will myself see to my daughters. And he strode to the door. Back, he cried to me, as I was following him. You must not go with me. You must not die as well as me. Think of your child. What could I do? I hesitated. That is the most torturing thing in such circumstances, not to know at all where one's duty lies. If one pays to the sick and the dead the loving service which one's heart yearns to do, then one spreads the germs of the evil wider again and brings danger on the others who have as yet been spared. One would be willing to sacrifice oneself, but one knows that in risking this one, risk sacrificing others also. In such a dilemma, there is only one helpful way, to give up life. Not one's own merely, 
but also that of all one's dear ones, to assume that all is done with, and for each one to stand by the other in his hours of suffering, as long as they last. Looking backward, looking forward, all that must cease. Together, on the deck of a sinking ship, no means of escape. Let us hold each other in our arms, close, close as possible to the last moment in a due fair world. The resignation had come over us all. The plan of flight had been given up. Everyone went to the bed of every patient and of every one who had died. Even Bressa no longer tried to keep us from this, the only humane way of acting. His neighborhood, his energetic, unresting rule, gave us a certain feeling of security. Our sinking ship was at least not without a captain. Oh, that cholera week in Grummet. Over twenty years have passed since then, but I still feel a shudder through my bones and marrow when I think of it. Tears, wailing, heart-rending death things, the smell of carbolic acid, the cracking of the bones of those seized with cramp, the disgusting symptoms, the incessant tolling of the death bell, the interment, no, the huddling away of the dead. For in such cases, there is no funeral pump. All the order of life given up. No meal times. The cook was dead. No going to sleep at night. Here and there, a morsel snatched standing and a doze as one sat in one's chair in the morning hours. Outside, as though from the irony of indifferent nature, the most splendid summer weather, the joyous song of the blackbird, the luxuriant colors of the flower beds, in the village, death without cessation. All the Prussians who were left behind were dead. I met the man who buries the dead today, said Francis, our valet de chambre, as he was coming back from the churchyard with his empty carriage. One or two more taken there? I asked. Oh, yes, six or seven, about half a dozen every day, sometimes even more. And it does happen sometimes that one or other gives a grunt or so inside the hearse there. But that makes no matter. In he goes into the trench, the duh. <sighs> Prussian. Next day, the monster died himself. And another man had to take up his office, at that time the most laborious in the place. The post brought nothing but sorrow. News from all quarters of the ravages of the pest. And love letters. Letters to remain forever unanswered, from Prince Henry, who knew nothing of what was going on. To Conrad, I had sent a single line to prepare him for the awful event. Lily, very ill. He could not come immediately. The service detained him. It was not till the fourth day that the poor fellow rushed into the house. Lily, he cried, is it true? He had heard of the misfortune as he was on the way. We said yes. He remained unnaturally still and tearless. I have loved her many years, was all he said, low to himself. Then aloud, where is she lying? In the churchyard? Goodbye. She is waiting for me. Shall I come with you? Someone offered. No, I prefer going alone. He went, and we saw him no more. On the grave of his sweetheart, he put a bullet through his brains. So ended Conrad Count Althaus, captain lieutenant in the 4th Regiment of Hussars in his 27th year. At another time, the tragic nature of this event would have produced a very shocking effect. But now, how many young officers had not the war carried off immediately? This one only indirectly. And at the moment when we heard of his deed, a new misfortune had occurred in our midst, which called for all the anguish of our hearts. Otto, my poor father's adored and only son, was seized by the destroying angel. His sufferings lasted the whole night and the next day, with alternations of hope and despair. About 7 p.m., all was over. My father threw himself on the corpse with such a thrilling shriek that it peeled through the whole house. We could hardly tear him from the dead body, and oh, the cries of agony that now ensued. 
For hours and hours long, the old man poured out howling, roaring, rattling shrieks of desperation. His son, his pride, his auto, his all. To this outburst succeeded on a sudden, a stiff, dumb apathy. He had not had the strength to attend the burial of his darling. He lay on a sofa, motionless, and it almost seemed unconscious. Bressa ordered him to be undressed and put to bed. After an hour, he seemed to awake. Aunt Mary, Frederick, and I were at his side. For a time, he looked about him with a questioning look and then sat up and tried to speak. He could not, however, pronounce a word and was struggling for breath with a puzzled face of anguish. Then he began to shake and to throw himself about as if he were attacked by those terrible cramps which are the last symptoms of the cholera, though he had not shown any of the other symptoms of it. At last, he got out one word, Martha. I fell on my knees at his bedside. Father, my poor dear father. He held his hands over my head. Your wish, said he with difficulty, may be fulfilled. I curse, I cur. He could get no further and sank back on his pillow. In the meantime, Bresser had come in and, in answer to our anxious questions, gave us his opinion that a spasm of the heart had caused my father's death. The most terrible thing, said Aunt Mary, after we had buried him, is that he departed with a curse on his lips. Don't trouble about that, Aunt, I said to console her. If that curse fell from the lips of everybody, yes, of everybody, it would be a great blessing to humanity. Such was the cholera week at Grommets. In the space of seven days, nine inhabitants of the chateau had been snatched away. My father, Lily, Rosa, Otto, my maid Nettie, the cook, the coachman, and two grooms. In the village during the same time, over eighty persons died. Stated in this dry way, all this sounds like a noteworthy statistical fact or if it stands recorded in the tale book like an extravagant play of the author's fancy. But it is neither so dry as the one nor so romantically terrible as the other. It is a cold, intelligible fact, full of sadness. It was not Grummet's alone in our neighborhood that was so hardly hit. Whoever chooses to search the annals of the neighboring villages and chateaux may find there plenty of similar cases of enormous calamity. For example, there is Schloss Stockern in the vicinity of the little town of Horn, of the family which inhabited it during the time from the 9th to the 13th of August, 1866, and also after the departure of the Prussian troops courted there, four members of the family, Rudolf, aged 20, his sisters Emily and Bertha, and his uncle Candid, and besides them, five of the servants succumbed to the plague. The youngest daughter, Pauline von Ingelschofen, was spared. She afterwards married a Baron Sutner, and she, even now, still tells with a shudder the tale of the cholera week at Stockton. At that time, such a resignation to woe and death had come over me that I was in daily expectation that death whose characters had been stamped on the land for the last two months, would carry off myself and my loved ones. My Frederick, my Rudolph, I actually wept for them in anticipation. And yet, along with all this, and in the midst of my trouble, I still had sweet moments. Such were when leaning on my husband's breast and encircled by his loving arms. I could pour my tears out on his faithful heart. How gently then would he speak words to me, not a consolation, but a fellow feeling and love, so that my own heart warmed and expanded to them. No, the world is not so bad. I was compelled against my will to think. The world is not all lamentation and cruelty. Compassion and love are alive in it, at present, it is true, 
only in individual souls, not as an all-pervading law and a prevailing normal condition. Still, they are present. And just as these feelings glow in us twain, sweetening by means of their gentle contact, even this time of suffering, just as they dwell in many other, nay, in most other souls, so they will one day come to an outbreak and will dominate the general relations of the human family. The future belongs to goodness. End of section 60. Section 61 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Allison Speaks. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 15, Part 1. Summer Sojourn in Switzerland My husband's researches in the history of the Geneva Convention and in international law. Seclusion and mourning. Visit to Vienna. Frederick enters a new army, the Army of Peace. Visit to Berlin. On our way, we visit the battlefield of Sadua on All Souls' Day. The Emperor as a mourner. Aunt Cornelia, her grief, and the consolations of religion. The Army Chaplain. A military theological discussion. We are summoned to Aunt Mary's deathbed. Retired life at Vienna. Minister to be sure. Political talks. Universal liability to serve. We passed the remainder of the summer in the neighborhood of Geneva, Dr. Bresser's powers of persuasion had at last succeeded in moving us to fly from the infected country. I at first strove against leaving so quickly the graves of my family, and, as I have said, I was filled with such a resignation to death that I had become wholly apathetic and held every attempt at flight to be useless. But, in spite of all this, Bresser was certain to conquer when he represented to me that it was my maternal duty to carry little Rudolph out of the way of danger as well as I could. That we chose Switzerland as our place of refuge resulted from Frederick's wish. He wanted to become acquainted with the men who had called the Red Cross into life, and to gain information on the spot about the proceedings of the conferences which had been held, as well as about the further aims of the convention. Frederick had given in his resignation of the military service, and as a preliminary had received half a year's leave till his request should be granted. I had now become rich, very rich. The death of my father, and of my brother and two sisters, had put me in possession of Grumitz and of the whole family property. "'Look here,' I said to Frederick when the title deeds were delivered to me from the notaries. What would you say if I were now to praise the war which had just passed because of the advantages which have fallen to my share from its consequences? Why, that you would not then be my Martha. Still, I understand what you mean. The heartless egotism which is capable of rejoicing over material gains that proceed out of the ruin of others, this impulse which every individual, even if he is base enough to feel it, still takes all possible care to hide, is proudly and openly confessed by nations and dynasties. Thousands have perished in untold sufferings, but we have thereby increased in territory and in power. So let there be praises and thanks to heaven for the successful war. We lived very quietly and retired in a small villa situated on the shore of the lake. I was so oppressed by the scenes through which I had gone that I would have absolutely no intercourse with any strangers. Frederick respected my mourning, and made no attempt whatever to recommend me the vulgar resource of diversion as a cure for it. I owed it to the graves at Grumitz, and my tender husband saw this well, to grieve over them for some time in perfect quiet. Those who had been hurried so speedily and so cruelly out of this fair world should not be equally quickly and coldly stolen also out of the place of memory which they held in my mourning heart. Frederick himself went often into the city in order to follow up the object of his stay there. 
the study of the Red Cross question. Of the results of this study I do not retain any clear recollection. I did not at the time keep any diary, and thus what Frederick communicated to me of the experiences he met with has for the most part passed out of my recollection. I only recollect clearly one impression which the whole of my surroundings made on me. The quiet, the ease, the cheerful activity of the people whom I happened to see, as if they were living in a most peaceful, most good-humored time. There was hardly anywhere even an echo of the war that had just ended, or at the most in a conversational tone, as if it had contributed one more interesting event, nothing more, which might furnish pleasant matter for talk along with the rest of European gossip, as if the awful thunder of the cannonades on the Bohemian battlefields had had nothing more tragic in them than a new opera by Wagner. The thing belonged now to history, and had for its result some alterations in the atlas. But its horror had passed out of recollection, or perhaps had never been present to these neutrals. It was forgotten. The pain was over. It had vanished. The same with the newspapers. I read French newspapers chiefly. All the interest was concentrated about the Universal Exhibition in Paris, which was in preparation for 1867. About the court festivities at Compiègne, about literary celebrities, two new geniuses had come to light who caused much discussion, Flaubert and Zola. About the events of the drama, a new opera by Gounod, a new leading part designed by Offenbach for Hortense Schneider, and so forth. The little exciting duel which the Prussians and Austrians had fought out La Ba and Bohème was an event that had already become, to some extent, a thing of the past. <sighs> what lies three months back, or at thirty miles' distance, what is not being played out in the domain of the now and the here, is a thing which the short feelers of the human heart and the human memory cannot reach. We quitted Switzerland towards the middle of October. We betook ourselves back to Vienna where the course of the business of my inheritance required my presence. When this business was dispatched, our intention was to stay for a considerable time at Paris. Frederick had it in his mind to smooth the way with all his power for the idea of a league of peace, and his view was that the projected universal exhibition offered the best opportunity for setting on foot a congress of friends of peace, and he also thought Paris was the most appropriate place for giving actual vitality to what was a matter of international concern. I have, he said, renounced the trade of war, and that I have done from convictions gained in actual war. I will now work for these convictions. I enter the service of the peace army, a very small army indeed, it is true, and one whose combatants have no other shield or sword than the sentiment of justice and the love of humanity. Still, Everything which has ultimately become great has started from small or invisible beginnings. <sighs> I sighed. It is a hopeless beginning. What can you, a single man, achieve against that mighty fortress, thousands of years old and garrisoned by millions of men? Achieve? I? I am not really so foolish as to hope that I personally can bring about a conversation. I was only saying just then that I wished to enter the ranks of the peace army. When I had my place in the army of war, did I, do you suppose, hope that I should save my country, that I should conquer a province? No. The individual can only serve. And still further, he must serve. A man who is penetrated by any cause cannot do better than work for it, then devote his life to it, even if he knows how little this life in and by itself, can contribute towards its victory. He serves because he must, not only the state, but our own conviction, if it is enthusiastic, lays on us the duty of defending it. You are right, and if at length there are enough millions animated by the enthusiasm of this duty, then that thousand-year-old fortress will be abandoned by its garrison and must fall. From Vienna I made a pilgrimage to Grumitz, whose mistress I had now become but I did not even enter the chateau. I only laid down four wreaths in the churchyard and drove back again. After my most important matters of business were put in order, Frederick proposed a little journey to Berlin in order to pay a visit to Aunt Cornelia, who was so much to be pitied. I assented. During our absence, I put my little son Rudolph in the charge of Aunt Mary. The latter had been cast down more than I can describe by the events of the cholera week at Grumitz. 
Her whole love, her whole interest in life, she now concentrated on my little Rudolph. I even hoped that she might be somewhat diverted and raised in her spirits by having the child with her for a time. We left Vienna on November 1. We broke our journey in Prague, intending to spend the night there. Next day, instead of pursuing our journey to Berlin, we made a new pilgrimage. All Souls' Day, I said. How many poor dead bodies are lying on the battlefield in this neighborhood, for whom even this day of honor to the graves does nothing, because they have no graves? Who will pay them a visit? I looked at him for a while in silence. Then, half aloud, I said, Will you? He nodded. We understood one another, and in an hour we were on our way to Klum and Kloningratz. End of section 61section 62 of lay down your arms this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org lay down your arms by berta von suttner translated by timothy holmes chapter 15 Part 2. What a prospect! An elegy of Tiedge came into my mind. Oh, sight of horror! Mighty prince, come, see, and o'er this awful heap of mouldering clay, swear to thy folk a gentler lord to be, and give to earth the light of peaceful day. Great leader, when thou thirstest for renown, come, count these skulls before the solemn hour when thine own head must lay aside its crown, and in death's silence ends thy dream of power. Let the dread vision hover o'er thee ever. Of these sad corpses here around thee strown, and then say, does it charm thee, the endeavor upon men's ruins to erect thy throne? Yes, unfortunately it will charm men, so long as the histories of the world, i.e., those who write them, build the statues of their heroes out of the ruins of war, so long as they offer their crowns to the titans of public murder to refuse the laurel crown, to give up fame would be nobler. Is that what the poet means? The first thing to do should be to despoil the thing, which it should appear so beneficent to renounce of its glory, and then there would be no ambitious man any longer to grasp after it. It was twilight already when we got to Chlum, and from thence walked on arm in arm to the battlefield near at hand in silent horror. A mist was falling, mingled with very fine snowflakes, and the dull branches of the trees were bent by the shrill-sounding pipe of a cold November wind. Crowds of graves and the graves of crowds were all around us. But a churchyard? No. No pilgrim weary of life had there been invited to rest and peace. There, in the midst of their youthful fire of life, exulting in the fullest strength of their manhood, the waiters on the future had been cast down by force and had been shoveled down into their grave mold. Choked up, stifled, made dumb forever, all those breaking hearts, those bloody, mangled limbs, those bitterly weeping eyes, those wild shrieks of despair, those vain prayers. On this field of war, 
it was not lonely. There were many, very many, whom All Souls' Day had brought hither, from friends and enemies' country, who were here come to kneel down on the ground where what they loved most had fallen. The train itself which brought us was full of other mourners, and thus I had heard now for several hours weeping and wailing going on around me. Three sons, three sons, each one more beautiful and better and dearer than the others, have I lost at Sedova, said to us an old man who looked quite broken down. Many others, besides of our companions in the carriage, mingled their complaints with his, for brother, husband, father, but none of these made so much impression on me as the tearless, mournful three sons, three sons of the poor old man. On the field one saw on all sides and on all the roads black figures walking or kneeling or painfully staggering along and breaking out from time to time into loud sobs. There were only a few there who were buried by themselves, few crosses or stones with an inscription. We bent down and deciphered, as well as the twilight permitted, some of the names. Major V. Royce of the Second Regiment of the Prussian Guards. Perhaps a relation of the one engaged to our poor Rosa, I remarked. Count Gruner, wounded July 3rd, died July 5th. What might he not have suffered in those two days? Was he, I wondered, a son of the Count Gruner who uttered before the war the well-known sentence, We are going to chase the Prussians away. What foot? Ah, how frantic and blasphemous! How shrilly out of tune sounds of a surety every word of provocation spoken before a war when one stands on a place like this. Words and nothing more. Boasting words, scornful words, spoken, written, and printed. It is these alone that have sown the seed of fields like these. We walk on, everywhere, earth heaps, more or less high, more or less broad, and even there, where the earth is not elevated, even under our feet, soldiers' corpses are perhaps moldering. The mist grows thicker constantly. Frederick, pray put your hat on, you will take cold. But Frederick remained uncovered, and I did not repeat my warning a second time. Among the mourners who were wandering about here were also many officers and soldiers, probably such as had themselves shared in the nobly contested day of Kuningratz, and now were making a pilgrimage to the place where their fallen comrades were sleeping. We had now come to the spot where the largest number of warriors, friend and foe together, lay entombed. The place was walled off like a churchyard. Hither came the greatest number of mourners, because in this spot there was most chance that their dear ones might be entombed. Round this enclosure the bereaved ones were kneeling and sobbing, and here they hung up their crosses and their grave lights. A tall, slender man of distinguished, youthful figure in a general's cloak came up to the mound. The others gave place reverently to him, and I heard some voices whisper, the emperor. Yes, it was Francis Joseph. It was the lord of the country, 
the supreme Lord of War, who had come on All Souls' Day to offer up a silent prayer for the dead children of his country, for his fallen warriors. He also stood with uncovered and bowed head there in agonized devotion before the majesty of death. Long, long he stood without moving. I could not turn my eyes away from him. What thoughts must be passing through his soul? What feelings through his heart, which after all was, as I knew, a good and a soft heart? It came into my mind that I could feel with him, that I could think the thoughts at the same time as he, which were passing through that bowed head of his. You, my poor, brave fellows, dead, and what for? No, we have not conquered. My Venice, lost. So much lost. Ah, so much. And your lo young lives, too. And you gave them so devotedly for me. Oh, if I could give them back to you. I, for my part, never desired the sacrifice. It was for you, for your country, that you, the children of my country, were led forth to this war. And not by my means, no, not though it was at my order, for I was not compelled to give the order. The subjects do not exist for my sake. No, I was called to the throne for their sakes, and any hour have I been ready to die for the weal of my people. Oh, had I followed the impulse of my heart, and never said, Yes, when all around me were shouting, War! War! Still, could I have resisted them? God is my witness that I could not. What impelled me? What forced me? At this moment I do not know exactly. Only so much I know. That it was an irresistible pressure from without, from yourselves, ye, dead soldiers. Oh, how mournful, mournful, mournful! How I have suffered for it all, and now you are lying here and on other battlefields, snatched away by grape shot and saber cuts, by cholera and typhus. Oh, if I had said no, you begged me to do so, Elizabeth. Oh, if I had said it. The thought is intolerable that, oh, it is a miserable, imperfect world. Too much, too much of woe. During the whole time that I was thinking thus for him, I fastened my eyes on his features. And now, yes, just as I came to too much, too much of woe, now he covered his face with both hands and broke out into a hot flood of tears. So passed All Souls' Day on the battlefield of Sedova. End of section 62。section 63 of Lay Down Your Arms。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 15, Part 3. We found the city of Berlin in the height of jubilation. Every counter jumper and every street loafer bore on his countenance a certain consciousness of victory. We have given the fellows there a good looking. That appears anyhow to be a very elevating feeling, and one which may be spread over the whole population. Still, in the families which we visited, we found many people deeply cast down, those, that is to say, who had one never to be forgotten lying dead on the German or Bohemian battlefields. For my own part, 
I feared most the meeting with Aunt Cornelia again. I knew that her handsome son Godfrey was her idol, her all, and I could judge of the pang which the poor bereaved mother must now be experiencing. I had only to fancy to myself that my Rudolph, if I had brought him up to manhood, no, that thought I absolutely refused to think out. Our visit was announced. With a beating heart I entered Frau von Teslow's house. Even in the antechamber, the morning which reigned in the house was perceptible. The footman who opened the door for us wore a black livery. In the great reception room, the chairs of which were covered over with chair covers, there was no fire lighted, and the mirrors and pictures on the walls were all covered with crepe. From hence the door into Aunt Cornelia's bedroom was open for us, and she received us there. It was a very large room, divided into two by a curtain, behind which the bed stood, and it served Aunt Cornelia now as her regular reception room. She no longer quitted the house at all, except every Sunday to go to the cathedral, and very seldom her room, except for one hour every day which she spent in what had been Godfrey's study. In this everything was left standing or lying as he had left it on the day of his departure. She took us into it, in the course of our visit, and made us read a letter, which he had laid on his portfolio. My own dear mother, I know well that you will come here after my departure, and then you will find this letter. My personal departure is over. So much the more will it please and surprise you to find one more line, to hear one more last word from me, and indeed a joyful, hopeful one. Be of good cheer. I shall come back again. Two hearts that hang together so entirely as ours do, fate will not tear asunder. I've settled now that I'm going to serve through a fortunate campaign, gain stars and crosses, and then make you a grandmother six times over. I kiss your hand. I kiss your dear soft forehead. Oh, you most adored of all little mothers. Your Godfrey. When we went into Aunt Cornelia's room, she was not alone. A gentleman in a long black coat, recognizable at the first glance as a clergyman, was sitting opposite to her. She got up and came to meet us. The clergyman rose at the same time from his seat, but remained standing in the background. What I expected occurred. When I embraced the old lady, both of us, she and I, broke out into loud sobs. Frederick also did not remain dry-eyed as he pressed the mourner to his heart. In this first minute no word at all was spoken. All that one could say at such a moment, at one's first meeting after a severe misfortune, is sufficiently expressed by tears. She led us back to the place where they were sitting, and pointed us to the chairs that stood there. Then, after drying her eyes, she made the introduction. My nephew, Colonel Baron Tilling, Herr Mosler, head military chaplain and consistorial counselor. Silent bows were exchanged. My friend and spiritual adviser, she proceeded, who has allowed me to lay on him the burden of instructing me in my trouble, but who unfortunately has not succeeded in instilling into you the proper resignation, the proper joy in bearing the cross, my valued friend, said he. Why is it that I have always to witness a fresh outburst of these very foolish tears? Oh, forgive me, when I last saw my nephew with his sweet young wife, my Godfrey was there. She could speak no further. Your son was there, in this sinful world, still exposed to all temptations and dangers, while now he has gone into the bosom of the Father, after meeting with the most glorious and most blessed of deaths for king and country. You, Colonel, turning now to my husband, who have just been introduced to me as a soldier, can assist me to give this afflicted mother the consolation that her son's fate is an enviable one. You must know what delight in death animates the brave warrior. The resolve to offer his life as a sacrifice on the altar of his country glorifies for him all the pain of departing this life. And though he sinks in the storm of the battle amidst the thunder of the artillery, yet he expects to be transferred to the great army on high, and to be present when the Lord of Sabbath holds muster above. You, Colonel, have come back in the number of those to whom divine providence has granted a righteous victory. Forgive me, Reverend Consistorial Counselor, I was in the Austrian service. Oh, I thought... Oh, really, replied the other, quite confused, a grand brave army, too, is the Austrian. He rose. But I will not intrude longer. You will be wishing, doubtless, to talk of family matters. 
farewell dear lady in a few days i will come again till then raise your thoughts to the all-merciful without whose will not a hair falls from our heads and who causes all things to serve for the good of those that love him even sorrow and suffering even privation and death i salute you with all devotion my aunt shook his hand i hope i shall see you soon very soon pray he bowed to us all and was stepping toward the door when frederick detained him reverend consistorial counsellor may i ask you a favour pray tell me what it is colonel i conclude from your conversation that you are penetrated equally by the religious and the military spirit in that case you might do me a great pleasure i listened with interest what could frederick mean the fact is he continued that my little wife here is full of scruples and doubts of all sorts her opinion is that from a christian point of view war is not quite permissible i of course know to the contrary for there is no alliance closer than that between the professions of priest and soldier but i have not the eloquence to make this clear to my wife would you then reverend consistorial counsellor so far favour us as to give us to-morrow or next day an hour of your conversation with the view oh with great pleasure the clergyman said interrupting him will you give me your address frederick gave him his card and the day and hour of the visit he asked for were fixed at once then we remained alone with our aunt does your intercourse with this friend really afford you consolation asked frederick consolation there is no consolation for me any more here below but he speaks so much and so beautifully about the things which i like most to hear of about death and mourning about the cross and sacrifice and resignation he paints the world which my poor godfrey had to leave and from which i long to be released as such a veil of misery of corruption of sin and of advancing ruin and so it seems to me a little less mournful that my child has been called away he is assuredly in heaven and here on this earth the powers of hell often prevail that is true i have again seen proof of that close to me replied frederick thoughtfully the poor lady next questioned him about the two campaigns that he had passed through the one with the other against godfrey he had to relate hundreds of details and in doing so he was able to give the bereaved mother the same comfort that he once brought me back from the war in italy namely that the lamented one had died a rapid and painless death it was a long and mournful visit i also again recounted there all the details of the horrible cholera week and my experiences on the bohemian battlefields before we left aunt cornelia took us into godfrey's room where i wept bitter tears anew at the perusal of the letter which i have quoted above and of which at a later period i begged a copy End of section sixty three section sixty four of lay down your arms this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nancy cochran gergen gilbert arizona lay down your arms by bertha von sutner translated by timothy holmes chapter fifteen part four now explain to me i said to frederick as we got into our carriage which was in waiting in front of aunt cornelia's villa why you asked the consistorial counsellor to a conference with you do not you understand that is to serve me as material for study i want to hear once more and this time to take note of the arguments by which priests defend public murder i put you forward as the leader in the fray it better becomes a young lady to nourish a doubt from the christian point of view as to the lawfulness of war than a gallant colonel but you know that my doubt is not from a religious but a humanitarian point of view we must not lay this at all before the reverend consistorial counsellor or else the discussion would be transferred to a different field the efforts after peace of free thinkers suffer from no internal inconsistency but it is this very inconsistency existing between the maxims of christianity and the orders of military authorities which i should like to hear explained by a military chaplain i e a representative of militant christianity the clergyman was punctual in his arrival 
The prospect was evidently an inviting one for him of having to preach a sermon of instruction and conversion. I, on the contrary, looked forward to the conversation with somewhat painful feelings, for the part assigned to me in it was a dishonest one. But, for the good of the cause to which Frederick had devoted his services henceforth, I was easily able to put some constraint on myself, and comfort myself with a proverb, the end justifies the means. After the first greetings, we were all three seated on low, easy chairs before the fire. The consistorial counselor began thus, Allow me, dear lady, to enter on the object of my visit. The matter is to remove from your soul some scruples, which are not destitute of some apparent grounds, but which can easily be refuted as sophistical. You think, for example, that Christ's command to love your enemies, and also the text, he who takes the sword shall perish by the sword, are inconsistent with the duties of a soldier, who no doubt is empowered to injure the enemy in body and life. Certainly, Reverend Counselor, this inconsistency seems to me irreconcilable. Then there occurs also the express command of the Decalogue, Thou shalt not kill. Oh, yes, to a superficial judgment there is some difficulty in that but on penetrating deeper all doubt vanishes. As regards the fifth commandment, it would be more correctly given, as it is actually in the English version of the Bible, thou shalt not murder. Killing for necessary defense is not murder. And war is in reality only necessary defense on a large scale. We can, and we ought, following the gentle precept of our Savior, to love our enemies, but that does not mean that we are not to venture to defend ourselves from open wrong and violence. Then does it not follow, of course, from this, that only defensive wars are justifiable, and that no sword stroke ought to be given till the enemy has invaded the country? But if the opposing nation proceeds on the same principle, how then can the battle ever begin? In the late war it was your army, Reverend Counselor, which first crossed the frontier and... If one wishes to keep the foe off, dear lady, as we have the most sacred right to do, it is utterly unnecessary to put off the favorable opportunity and to wait until he has first invaded one's country. On the contrary, the sovereign must, under all circumstances, have freedom to anticipate the violent and unjust. In doing so, he is following the written word... He who takes the sword shall perish by the sword. He presents himself as God's servant and avenger on the enemy, because he strives to make him, as he has taken the sword against him, perish by the sword. There must be some fallacy in that, I said, shaking my head. It is impossible that these principles should justify both parties equally. And as to the further scruple, pursued the clergyman, without noticing my remark, that war is of, and by itself displeasing to God, this must depart from every Christian who believes in the Bible, for the Holy Scriptures sufficiently prove that the Lord himself gave commands to the people of Israel to wage wars in order to conquer the promised land, and he granted them victory and his blessing on their wars. In Numbers 21.14, a special book of the wars of the Lord is spoken of, and how often in the Psalms is the assistance celebrated which God has granted to his people in war? Do you not know what Solomon says? Proverbs 21.31 The horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. In Psalm 144, David thanks and praises the Lord his strength, who teacheth his hand to war and his fingers to fight. Then a contradiction prevails between the Old and the New Testament. The God of the ancient Hebrews was a warlike deity, but the gentle Jesus proclaimed the message of peace and taught love to neighbor and to enemy. In the New Testament also, Jesus speaks in a figure, Luke 14.31, without the least blame of a king who is going to make war against another king. And how often, too, does not the Apostle Paul use figures from the military life? He says, 
Romans 13.4, that the magistrate does not bear the sword in vain, but is God's servant, a revenger on him that doeth evil. Well, then, in that case, the contradiction I mean exists in the Holy Scripture itself. By your showing me that it is present in the Bible, you do not remove it. There one sees the superficial and at the same time arrogant method of judgment, which seeks to exalt one's own weak reason above the word of God. Contradiction is something imperfect, ungodlike, and if I show that a thing is in the Bible, the proof is complete that in itself, however incomprehensible it may be to the human understanding, it can contain no contradiction. Unless the presence of contradiction does not much rather prove that the passages in question cannot possibly be of divine origin. This answer trembled on my lips, but I suppressed it in order not to change entirely the object of the discussion. Look here, Reverend Counselor, said Frederick, now mingling in the conversation. A chief captain of artillery in the seventeenth century has laid down much more forcibly than you have done the justifiability of the horrors of war by an appeal to the Bible. I extracted the passage and have read it to my wife, but she did not sympathize with the spirit expressed in it. I confess the thing seems to me, well, a little strong, and I should like to hear your view about it. If you will allow me, I will fetch the paper. So he took a sheet of paper out of a drawer, unfolded it, and read. War was invented by God himself, and taught to men. God posted the first soldier with a two-edged sword in front of paradise, to keep out of it Adam, the first rebel. You may read in Deuteronomy how God, by means of Moses, gives people encouragement to victory, and even gives them his priests for advance guard. The first stratagem was practiced at the city of Ai. In this war of the Jews, the sun had to stand and show light in the firmament for two whole days together, in order that the war and the victory might be followed up, and many thousands put to the sword and their kings hung up. All the horrors of war are permitted by God, for the whole of the Holy Writ is full of them, and proves satisfactorily that regular war is an invention of God himself, and that, therefore, every man can, with a clear conscience, serve in it, and can live and die in it. He is permitted to burn his enemy, or brand him, flay him, shoot him down, or hack him to pieces. All this is just, that others judge as they please about it. God, in these passages, has forbidden nothing, but has permitted the most horrible ways of destroying men. The prophetess Deborah nailed the head of Sisera, the leader in that war, to the earth. Gideon, chosen by God as the leader of the people, revenged himself on the princes of Sukheth, who had refused him some provisions, like a soldier. Sword and fire were too poor. They were thrashed and torn in pieces with thorns. And, as before, this was righteous in the sight of God. The royal prophet David, a man after God's own heart, invented the most cruel tortures for the vanquished children of Ammon at Rabbath. He had them hewed with sabers, caused chariots to drive over them, cut them with knives, and dragged them through the places where they made the bricks. And so did he in all the towns of the children of Ammon. Besides this, That is horrible, abominable, broke in the chief chaplain. It could only be a rough soldier, of the savage times of the Thirty Years' War, to whom it would appear natural to produce examples like these out of the Bible, in order to found thereon a justification for their cruelties against the enemy. We preach quite other doctrine now. Nothing more is to be striven for in war than to make your adversary incapable of harm, even up to his death, but without any evil design against the life of any individual." If any such design enters in, or even any murderous desire or any cruelty against those who are defenseless, in such a case killing in war is exactly as immoral and as impermissible as in peace. No doubt in past centuries, when the adventurous delight in feud and quarrel prevailed, 
when leaders of lanchnecks and vagrant persons carried on war as a trade, in such times an artillery captain might ride in that style. But in the present day, armies are not put into the field for gold and booty, not without knowing for whom or for what, but for the highest ideal objects of mankind, for freedom, independence, nationality, for justice, faith, honor, purity, and morality. You, Reverend Consistorial Council, I interposed, are at least milder and more humane than the artillery captain, and thus you have no proofs out of the Bible to allege for the lawfulness of cruelty in which our forefathers of the Middle Ages, and presumably also the ancient Hebrews, took a pleasure. And yet it is the same book, and the same Jehovah, and he cannot have become milder. And everybody still gets from him as much support as suits his views. On this I received a slight sermon of rebuke for my want of reverence for the word of God, and for my want of judgment in reading it. Still, I succeeded in leading the conversation back again to our special subject, and now the consistorial council launched out into a long dissertation, and one which this time was allowed to be uninterrupted, about the connection between the military and Christian spirits. He spoke of the religious devotion, which is dwelling in the oath to the standard, when the colors are carried solemnly, with the accompaniment of music, into the church, with the guard of honor of two officers with drawn swords. And there the recruit marches out for the first time in public with helmet and sidearms, and for the first time follows the colors of his company, unfolded now before the altar of the Lord, torn as they are, and stained with the honorable marks of the battles in which they have been carried. He spoke of the prayer offered every Sunday in church, preserve the royal commander of the army, and all true servants of their king and country. Teach them as Christians to think of their end, and grant that their servants may be blessed, to the honor and the good of the country. God with us, he went on, is, as you know, the motto on the belt buckle with which the foot soldier buckles on his side arms, and this watchword should give him confidence. If God be with us, who can be against us? Then, there are also the universal days of public prayer and humiliation, which are ordered at the commencement of a war, that the people may beg for God's help in prayer, both in the comfortable hope of his support and in the confidence through the support of gaining a victorious termination. What devotion does there not lie in this for the departing warrior? How mightily does this exalt his delight in battle and in death? He can, with comfort, enter into the ranks of the warriors when his king calls for him, and can reckon on victory and blessing for the cause of right. God the Lord will no more deprive our people of this than his people, Israel of old, if only it is with prayers to him that we carry on the work of battle. The ultimate alliance between prayer and victory, between piety and valor, easily follows, for what can more assure one of joy in the prospect of death than the confidence that if our last hour should strike in the confusion of the battle, we shall find favor at the hands of the judge in heaven. Fidelity and faith, in union with manliness and warlike virtue, belong to the oldest traditions of our people. He went on in this tone for a long time more, now with oily mildness, with sunken head, in the softest tones, speaking of love, humility, little children, salvation, and precious things, now with military voice of command, with a proud, erect attitude, talking of strict morals and stern discipline, sharp and cutting, of sword and shield. The word joy was never used otherwise than in composition with death, battle, and dying. From the point of view of the army chaplain, to kill and to be killed seemed to be the most exquisite delights in life. Everything else is exhausting, sinful pleasure. Verses, too, were recited. First this one of Kerner. Father, do thou guide me. Guide me to victory. Guide me to death. Lord, I confess thy command. Lord, as thou willest, so guide me. God, I confess thee. Then the old popular song of the Thirty Years' War. 
no happier death on earth can be than one good stroke from mortal foe on fresh green turf in breezes free no woman's tears no cries of woe no grim death-bed whence lone and slow from life's gay scene your soul must go like swaths of grass in lusty row mid shouting friends death lays you low and then the song by lenau of the war-loving armorer peace steals on and mining slowly saps our vigor dims our story while she boasts her influence holy cobwebs gather o'er our glory hark then sounds war's joyous rattle wounds may yawn blood flow in battle we need yawn in sloth no longer war's pruning makes mankind the stronger and to conclude the saying of luther when i look at war as a thing that protects wife child house land goods and honor and in doing so gains peace and secures it in that view war is the right precious thing oh yes if i look at the panther as a dove in that case the panther is a very gentle beast i remarked unheard the military chaplain did not allow himself to be disturbed in his flow of eloquence and when he ended and took leave i found myself with two convictions that war from the christian point of view is a justifiable and in and by itself is a precious thing it was visibly a very agreeable thing to him to have by means of this rhetorical victory both fulfilled the duty of his profession and in doing so rendered a considerable service to the foreign colonel for as he rose to go and we expressed to him our thanks for the trouble he had been so good as to undertake he deprecatingly rejoined it is for me to thank you for having given me an opportunity of chasing away your doubts through my feeble word whose entire efficacy is to be ascribed to the word of god which i have so often quoted doubts which are of such a nature as to bring nothing but pain to a person who is not only a christian but a soldier's wife peace be with you oh i groaned when he was gone that was torture yes said frederick it was our want of straightforwardness especially was uncomfortable to me and particularly the false premises under which we got him to display his eloquence at one moment i was on the point of saying to him stop reverend sir i myself entertain the same views against war as my wife and what you are saying only serves as far as i am concerned to enable me to see more clearly the weakness of your arguments but i held my tongue why interfere with an honest man's conviction a conviction which is besides the foundation of his profession in life conviction are you certain of that does he really believe that he is speaking the truth or does he purposely deceive his common soldiers when he promises them an assured victory through the assistance of a god of whom he nevertheless must know this that he is invoked in exactly the same way by the enemy these appeals to our people and to our cause as the only righteous one and one which is god's cause too were surely only possible at a time when one people shut out all other peoples and considered itself as the only one entitled to exist the only one beloved of god and then all these promises of heaven with the view of more easily procuring the sacrifice of earthly life all these ceremonies consecrations oaths hymns which are intended to awaken in the breast of the man ordered into war that joy in death repulsive words to me which they so admire is it not everything has two sides martha said frederick interrupting me it is because we deprecate war that everything which supports and excuses it everything which veils its horrors appears hateful to us yes of course because the hateful thing is upheld thereby but not thereby only all institutions stand on roots of a thousand fibers and as long as they exist it must be a good thing that those feelings and methods of thought should persist by which they are excused by which they are rendered not only tolerable 
but even beloved. How many a poor fellow is helped through his death agony by that same joy in death into which he has been educated? How many a pious soul relies in all confidence on the help of God, of which he has been assured by the preacher? How much innocent vanity and proud feeling of honor are awakened and satisfied by those ceremonies? How many hearts beat higher at the sound of those hymns? From the total of the pain which war has brought on men, we must at least deduct that pain which war poets and war preachers have contrived to sing away and lie away. End of section 64. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Section 65 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha Von Sutner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 15, Part 5. We were summoned away from Berlin very hurriedly. A telegram announced to me that Aunt Mary was very ill and wished to see me. I found the old lady given up by her physicians. It is my turn now, she said. For my own part, I am right willing to go. Since my poor brother and the three children were snatched away, this world has had no more joy for me. Apart from anything else, I shall never more have the strength to bear up after such a blow. I shall find the others there above. Conrad and Lily are also united there. It was not ordained that they should be united here on earth. If they had finished their arrangements in proper time, I was disposed to say in opposition. But I stopped myself. I could not surely raise any discussion with this dying person, and still less try to unsell her about her favorite theory of preordination. I have one comfort, she went on that you, at least, dear Martha, remain behind happy. The cholera has spared you, and that proves clearly that it is ordained for you to grow old in company. Only try to make of your little Rudolph a good Christian and a good soldier, so that his grandfather up in heaven may still find his joy in him. Even on this point I preferred to keep silence, for I was firmly resolved to make no soldier of my son. I will pray for you incessantly, so that you may live long and happily. Of course, I did not dwell on the inconsistency that an inevitable destiny could be influenced in one's favor by incessant prayer, but I interrupted the poor creature by begging her not to exhaust herself with talking, and, in order to distract her attention, told her about our doings in Switzerland and Berlin. I also related how we met Prince Henry, and that he had caused to be erected in the park of his castle a marble monument in memory of the bride whom he had lost as soon as won. Three days afterwards, poor Aunt Mary fell asleep, resigned and calm, fortified with the sacrament for the dying, which she had herself begged for and which she received with devotion, and thus were all my relations gone from the earth, all those in whose midst I had been brought up. In her will, the entire inheritance of her little fortune was left to my son Rudolph, and as his trustee, minister, to be sure, was nominated. This circumstance brought me now into frequent contact with this old friend of my father. He was also pretty nearly the only visitor at our house. The deep mourning into which the unhappy week at Grumitz had plunged me caused me, as a matter of course, to live in perfect retirement. Our plan of settling in Paris could not be carried out till all my affairs were put in order, and in any case, several months more would be necessary for that. Our friend, the minister, who, as I have said, formed almost the whole of our society, had in these latter days either received or obtained his discharge. I never quite fathomed the matter, but in short he had withdrawn into private life but he was still as fond as ever of busying himself about politics. He continually contrived to turn the conversation onto this, his favorite theme, and we also willingly took our share in it. 
as frederick was now occupying himself so busily with the study of international law any discussion was welcome to him which touched on this province after dinner mr to be sure for we always between ourselves made use of this nickname for him was always asked to dine at our house twice a week the two gentlemen would plunge into a long political conversation but in doing this my husband took care not to let this conversation turn into the political gossip which he so hated but was careful to lead it to views of more general interest in this to be sure mr to be sure could not always follow him for in his character as an inveterate diplomatist and official he had accustomed himself to follow what is called practical politics a thing which is directed merely to the private interests which lie nearest to hand and knows nothing about the theoretical questions of social science i sat by busy over some needlework and took no share in the conversation a thing which seemed quite natural to the minister for politics is as is well known far too high a thing for ladies he was sure that i was thinking all the time of other things whilst i on the contrary was listening very attentively since it was my business to impress the tenor of this dialogue on my memory in order to transfer it afterwards into the red book frederick made no secret of his opinions though he knew what a thankless part it is to set oneself to oppose what is generally received and to defend ideas whilst they are in the stage when even if they are not condemned as subversive still they are derided as fantastic i am in a position to-day to communicate to you an interesting piece of news dear tilling said the minister one afternoon with an air of importance people in government circles that is to say in the ministry of war are ventilating the idea of introducing a universal liability to service amongst us also what the same system which before the war was so universally condemned and derided among us tailors and arms and so on to be sure we had a prejudice against it a short time since still it has rendered good service to the prussians you must allow and in fact from the moral point of view and even from the democratic and liberal point of view for which you occasionally appear so enthusiastic it is surely a just and elevating thing that every son of his fatherland without any regard to his position or stage of education should have to fulfil the same duties and from a strategic point of view could little prussia have been always victorious if she had not had the landwehr and if the latter had been introduced amongst us before should we have been always beaten well the meaning of that is that if we had had more material the material which our enemy had would not have served him ergo if the land were were introduced everywhere it would not benefit anybody the war game would be played with more pieces but the game nevertheless depends still on the luck and the ability of the players i will suppose that all the european powers have introduced the obligation of universal defence the proportion of forces in that case remains exactly the same the only difference would be that in order to come to a decision instead of hundreds of thousands millions would have to be slaughtered but do you think it just and fair that a part only of the population should sacrifice themselves in order to protect the dearest possessions of the others and that these others chiefly because they are rich should be entitled to stop quietly at home no no that will cease with this new law then there will be no more buying off every one will have to take his part and it is especially the educated the students those who have some learning who will contribute the elements of intelligence and therefore a victory the other side has the same elements ready to hand and so the advantages to be gained from educated petty officers neutralize each other on the other hand what remains and equally to both sides is the loss of material of priceless mental worth of which the country is deprived by the fact that the most educated those who might have promoted its civilization by means of inventions works of art or scientific inquiry are set up in rank and file to be marks for the enemy's shot 
Oh, well, for making inventions and producing works of art and investigating skull bones and all sorts of things of that kind which do not advance the position of the state's power one drachma. Hmm, what? Oh, nothing, go on. For all that, there remains plenty of time for people. And besides, they need not serve for the whole of their life, but a few years of strict discipline are assuredly good for everybody and make them only so much the more competent to fulfill their other duties as citizens. We must, in the present state of things, pay the blood tax some time, so it ought to be divided between all equally. There would be something to say for that, if it fell less heavily on individuals on that account. But that would not be the case. The blood tax would not be divided by that measure, but increased. I hope the project may not be carried out. There is no seeing whither it may lead. One state would then try to outvie the other in strength of army, till at last there would no longer be any armies, but only armed nations. More people would be constantly drawn into the service, the length of service would be constantly increased, the incidence of war taxes and the costs of armaments constantly greater, so that without fighting each other, the nations would all come to ruin in making preparations for war. But, dear Tilling, you look too far. One can never look too far. Everything a man undertakes, he ought to think out to its remotest consequence, at least as far as his mind reaches. We were likening war, just now, to a game at chess. Politics, also, is of the same nature, Your Excellency, and those are only very feeble players who look no further forward than a single move and are quite pleased with themselves if they have got into a position in which they can threaten a pawn. I want to develop the thought of defensive forces constantly increasing and the universal extension of liability to military service still more widely till we reach the extremist verge, i.e., where the mass becomes excessive. What then, if, after the greatest numbers and the furthest limits of age are reached, one nation should take it into its head to recruit regiments of women too? The others might imitate it. Or battalions of boys? The others must imitate it. And in the armaments, in the means of destruction, where can the limit be? Oh, this savage, blind leap into the pit! Calm yourself, dear Tilling. You are a genuine faddist. If you could only point me out a means to do away with war, it would be a perfect benefit, to be sure. But, as that is not possible, every nation must surely endeavor to prepare itself, for it is as well as possible, in order to assure itself of the greatest chance of winning in the inevitable struggle for existence. That is the cant word of the fashionable Darwinism, is it not? If I should choose to suggest to you the means of doing away with wars, you would again call me a silly faddist, a sentimental dreamer, rendered morbid by the humanitarian craze. That, I think, is the cant word in favor with the war party, is it not? To be sure, I cannot conceal from you that no practical foundation exists for the realization of such an ideal. One must calculate with the actual factors. In these are classed the passions of men, their rivalries, the divergences of interests, the impossibility of coming to an agreement on all questions. But that is not necessary. When disagreements begin, an arbitration tribunal, not force, is to decide. The sovereign states would never betake themselves to such a tribunal, nor would the peoples. The peoples? The potentates and diplomatists would not. But the people? Just inquire, and you will find that the wish for peace is warm and true in the people, while the peaceful assurances, which proceed from the governments, are frequently lies, hypocritical lies, or at least are regarded as such, on principle, by other governments. That is precisely what is called diplomacy, and the peoples will go on, ever more and more, calling for peace. If the general obligation of defense should extend, the dislike of war will increase in the same proportion. A class of soldiers, 
animated with love for their calling is, of course, imaginable. Their exceptional position, which they take for a position of honor, is offered to them as a recompense for the sacrifice which it entails. But when the exception ceases, the distinction ceases also. The admiring thankfulness disappears, which those who stay at home offer to those who go out in their defense, because then there will be no one to stay at home. The war-loving feelings, which are always being suggested to the soldier, and, in so doing, are often awakened in him, will be more seldom kindled. For who are those that are of the most heroic spirit, who are most warm in their enthusiasm for the exploits and dangers of war? Those who are safe against them, the professors, the politicians, the beer-shop chatterers, the chorus of old men, as it is called in Faust. When the safety is lost, that chorus will be silenced. Besides, if not only those devote themselves to the military life, who love and praise it, but all those also are forcibly dragged into it, who look on it with horror, that horror must work. Poets, thinkers, friends of humanity, timid persons, all these will, from their own point of view, curse the trade they are forced into. But they will, beyond doubt, have to keep silent about this way of thinking, in order not to pass for cowards, in order not to expose themselves to the displeasure of the higher powers. Keep silence? Not forever. As I talk, though I have myself kept silent long, so will the others also break out into speech. If the thought ripens, the word will come. I am an individual who have come to the age of forty, before my conviction acquired sufficient strength to expand itself into words. And, as I have required two or three decades, so the masses will perhaps require two or three generations. But speak they will at last. End of section 65. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Section 66 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lay Down Your Arms by Berta von Sutna. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 16, Part 1. New Year's Day, 1867. The Luxembourg question. Disputes between France and Prussia. Arbitration. The alarm blows over. We visit Paris. Plan of Napoleon III for general disarmament. Frederick's efforts in the cause of peace. The protocol of peace. A little daughter is born to us. Renewed happiness. Frederick's studies. Monsieur Desmoulins' proposals. Return to Paris and re-entry into the gay world. Talk of the Revanche de Sadova, pressure of the war party on Napoleon III, whirl of gaiety. We seek repose in Switzerland, illness of my little daughter. Return to Paris in March 1870. Napoleon III drops his plan of disarmament under the pressure of the war party. Still peace seems assured. The New Year, 67. We kept the Sylvester night quite alone, my Frederick and I. When it struck twelve, do you recollect, I asked with a sigh, the speech my poor father made in proposing a toast last year at the same hour? I do not dare to wish you good fortune now. The future sometimes hides something so unexpectedly terrible in its bosom, and no wish has ever availed to turn it aside. Then let us use the turn of the year, Marta as an occasion not for thinking of what is coming, but for looking back into the year which has just flown by. What sufferings you have had to endure, my poor brave wife, so many of your dear ones buried, and those days of horror on the battlefields in Bohemia. I do not grieve that I have seen the cruel things that took place there. Now I can at least participate with all the might of my soul in your efforts. We must bring up your, rather our, Rudolph, with a view of his pushing these efforts further, in his time a visible mark will perhaps arise above the horizon, hardly in ours, 
What a noise the people are making in the streets. They are greeting with shouts the new year, in spite of the sufferings which the old one, that was greeted in the same way, brought on them. Oh, how forgetful men are! Do not chide them too much for their forgetfulness, Frederick. We too are beginning to brush away from our memory the sufferings of the past, and what I feel is the bliss of the present, the bliss of having you, my own one. We were not to speak of the future, I know, still I think that the future we have before us is good. United, loving, sufficient in ourselves, rich, how many exquisite enjoyments can not life still offer us? We will travel, we'll make acquaintance with the world, the world that is so fair, fair so long as peace prevails, and peace may now last for many, many years. But if war is to break out again, you are no longer involved in it, and Rudolph, too, is not threatened, since he is not going to be a soldier. But if, according to Minister To Be Sure's information, every man should be obliged to share in the defence, oh, nonsense! So what I mean is we will travel, we will bring up our Rudolph to be a pattern man, we will follow our noble aim, the propaganda of peace, and we, we will love each other. The carnival this same year brought with it once more balls and pleasures of all sorts, but my mourning kept me away from all such things. But what astonished me was that the whole of society did not abstain from such mad goings on. Surely there must have been a loss in almost every family. But as it seemed, folks set all that at naught. A few houses, it's true, remained closed, especially among the aristocracy. But there was no want of opportunities for the young people to dance, and the most favoured partners were, of course, those who'd come back from the battlefields of Italy and Bohemia. And the naval officers were those most fated, especially those who had fought at Lisa. Half the lady world had fallen in love with Tegetov, the youthful admiral, as they had done with the handsome General Gablenz after the campaign of Schleswig-Holstein. Kustotza and Lisa were the two trump cards which were everywhere played in any conversation about the war which was over. Along with this, the needle gun and Landwehr came in, two institutions which must be introduced as speedily as possible, and then future victories were assured to us. Victories? When and over whom? On this point people did not speak out, but the idea of revenge which is wont to accompany the loss of a game, even if it be only a game at cards, was hovering over all the utterances of the politicians. If even we did not ourselves take the field once more against the Prussians, perhaps there might be others who would take it on themselves to avenge us. All appearances seemed to show that France would get into a quarrel with our conquerors, and then they might get paid off for a good deal. The thing had even got a name in diplomatic circles, La Revanche de Sadova. Such was the triumphant announcement to us of Minister, to be sure. It was at the beginning of spring that once more a certain black spot appeared on the horizon, a question, as they call it. The news also of French preparations provided the conjectural politicians with what they loved so, the prospect of war. The question this time was called that of Luxembourg. Luxembourg! What was there, then, of such great importance to the world in that? On this subject I had again to embark in studies similar to those about Schleswig-Holstein. The name was indeed familiar to me only from Suppe's Jolly Companions, in which, as is well known, a Count of Luxembourg spends all he has in dress, dress, dress. The result of my studies was as follows. Luxembourg belonged, according to the treaties of 1814 and 1816, ah, there we have it, treaties. They contain ready-made the root of a national quarrel, a fine institution, these treaties, to the King of the Netherlands, and at the same time to the German Bund. Prussia had the right to garrison the capital. Now, however, as Prussia had renounced her share in the old Bund, how could she keep the right of garrison? That was the point, the question. The Peace of Prague had in fact introduced a new system into Germany, and thereby the connection with Luxembourg had been dissolved. Why, then, did the Prussians maintain their right of garrison? To be sure, that was an intricate affair, and the most advantageous and righteous way of settling it would be to slaughter fresh hundreds of thousands. That every enlightened politician must allow. The Dutch had never attached any importance to the possession of the Grand Duchy. The king also, William III, attached no importance to it, and would have been happy to cede it to France for a sum to be paid into his privy purse. So private negotiations now commenced between the king and the French cabinet. Exactly, secrecy is always the essence of all diplomacy. The peoples are not to know anything of the matters in dispute. As soon as the latter are ripe for decision, they have the right to bleed for them. 
Why and wherefore they are fighting each other is a question of no importance. It was not till the end of March that the king made the official announcement, and on the same day as that on which his assent was telegraphed to France, the Prussian ambassador at The Hague was informed of it. On that began negotiations with Prussia. The latter appealed to the guarantees of the treaties of 1859, the foundations on which the Kingdom of Holland stood. Public opinion in Prussia, what is meant by public opinion, possibly the writers of leading articles, was indignant that the old German Reichsland should be torn away, and in the Reichstag of North Germany on April 1st there were heated questions on the subject. Bismarck, it is true, remained cool about Luxembourg, but nevertheless he set on foot preparations against France on this occasion, and they, of course, were followed by counter-preparations on the French side. Ah, how well I know that tune! At that time I trembled sorely for fear of a new fire being lighted in Europe, no want of people to poke it. In Paris, Cassagnac and Émile de Girardin, in Berlin, Menzel and Heinrich Leo, have then such provokers of war even the remotest notion of the gigantic enormity of their transgression? I hardly think so. It was at this time, as I first heard the tale many years after, that Professor Simpson used the following expression in the presence of the Crown Prince Frederick of Prussia about the question in dispute. Quote, if France and Holland have already come to an agreement, that signifies war. Unquote. To which the Crown Prince, in hot excitement and alarm, replied, you have never seen war. If you had seen it, you would not pronounce the word so quietly. I have seen it, and I say to you that it is the highest duty, if it be anyhow possible, to avoid it. And this time it was avoided. A conference met at London, which on May 11th led to the wished-for peaceable solution. Luxembourg was declared neutral, and Prussia drew her troops out. The friends of peace breathed again, but there were plenty of people who were discontented at this turn of affairs. Not the Emperor of the French, he wished for peace, but the French war party. In Germany, too, there were voices raised to condemn the behavior of Prussia, sacrifice of a fortress, submission looking like fear, and other things of the kind. But every private person also, who on the sentence of a court gives up his claim to any possessions, shows the same submission. Would it be better for him not to bow to any tribunal, but to settle the matter with his fists? The result achieved by the Conference of London may, in such doubtful questions, be always achieved, and the leaders of states can always find that avoidance possible, which Frederick the Noble, afterwards Frederick III, called the highest duty. End of section 66, read by Sandra. Section 67 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lay Down Your Arms by Berta von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 16, Part 2. In May we betook ourselves to Paris to visit the exhibition. I had not yet seen the world's capital and was quite dazzled by its splendor and its life. At that time especially the empire was standing at its highest pitch of splendor, and all the crowned heads of Europe had collected there, and at that time above all others, Paris presented a picture of splendor the most joyful and the most secure of peace. The city appeared to me at that time not like the capital of a single country, but like the capital of internationality, that city which three years afterwards was to be bombarded by its eastern neighbor, all the nations of the earth had assembled in the great palace in the Champ de Mars for the peaceful, nay profitable, because productive, not destructive, strife of business competition. Riches, works of art, marvels of manufactory were brought together here, so that it must have excited pride in every beholder to have lived in a time so progressive and so full of promise of further progress, and along with this pride must naturally have arisen the purpose never more to hamper the march that development of civilization which was spreading enjoyment all round by the brutal rage of destruction. All these kings, princes, and diplomatists who were assembled here as guests of the emperor and empress could not surely be thinking, amidst all the civilities that were interchanged, the courtesies and the good wishes of exchanging next time shots with their hosts or one another. No, I breathed again. This really splendid exhibition fate seemed to me the pledge that now an era of long, long years of peace had begun, 
at most against an incursion of Tartar hordes or something of that sort, these civilized people might draw the sword, but against each other we were never more to see that it was hoped. What strengthened me in this opinion was a communication that reached me from a well-informed trustworthy source about a favorite plan of the emperor for a general disarmament. Yes, Napoleon III was strong on that point. I have it from the mouth of his nearest relations and most trusted friends, and on the next convenient opportunity he was going to communicate to all the European governments a proposal for reducing their military establishments to a minimum. That was good to hear. It was, at any rate, a more reasonable idea than that of a general increase of forces. In this way, the well-known demand of Kant would be granted, which is thus formulated in paragraph 3 of the preliminary article to an everlasting peace. Quote, Standing armies, miles perpetuus, are in time to cease absolutely. They are a constant menace of war to other states. In consequence of the readiness to appear always prepared for war, they provoke them to overpass each other in the mass of preparations, which know no limit, O oh, prophetic glance of wisdom! And inasmuch as the costs of maintaining peace become at last more burdensome than a short war, they are themselves causes of offensive war in order to get rid of this burden. Unquote. What government could decline a proposition such as that which France was meditating without unmasking its lust of conquest? What nation would not revolt against such a refusal? The plan must succeed. Frederick did not share my confidence. In the first place, he said, I doubt whether Napoleon will make the proposal. The pressure of the war party will hinder him. As a general rule, the occupants of thrones are prevented by those who surround them from the exercise of those great efforts of individual will, which fall quite outside of the usual pattern. In the second place, one cannot give to a living being the command to cease to exist in this sort of way. It straightway sets itself on its defense. Of what living being are you speaking? Of the army. That is an organism, and as such has powers of life development and of self-maintenance. At the present time this organism is just in its prime, and as you see, for the system of universal defense will surely be introduced into other countries, is just on the point of being powerfully extended. And yet you want to fight against it? Yes, but not by stepping up to it and saying, Die, thou monster, for the organism in question would hardly do me the kindness to stretch itself dead at my feet on that summons, but I am fighting against it in appearing on behalf of another living form, which is still only in its fragile bud, but which, as it gains in power and extent, will crush the other out. It is your fault to begin with, Marta, that I talk in these scientific metaphors. It was you who first led me to study the works of the modern students of nature. From this, there has arisen in me the view that the phenomena of social life also cannot be understood in their origin or foreseen in their future course till one conceives of them as existing under the influence of eternal laws. Of this most politicians and people in positions of high dignity have no notion, not the faintest, the worthy soldier certainly not. A few years ago it had not entered my head either. We were living in the Grand Hotel on the Boulevard des Capucines. It was occupied chiefly by English people and Americans. We met few of our own people. The Austrians are not fond of travel. Besides, we sought for no acquaintance. I had not put off my mourning, and we cherished no wish for company. Of course, I had my son Rudolf with me. He was now eight years old and a wonderfully clever little fellow. We had hired a young Englishman who performed the duties partly of tutor, partly of nursery governess to the boy. In our long visits to the exhibition palace, as well as our numerous excursions into the neighborhood, we could not, of course, always take Rudy with us, and besides, the time was now also come for him to begin to learn. New, new, new to me was the whole of this world here open to us. All the men who had come together from the four corners of the earth, the richest and most distinguished from every quarter, these fight, this expenditure, this turmoil, I was literally deafened by it. But interesting and full of enjoyment as it was to me to receive into my mind these surprising and overpowering impressions, yet when alone I wished myself out of all this hubbub again, and in some remote peaceful spot where I could live in quiet retirement, along with Frederick and my child, nay, my children, for I was looking forward confidently to the joy of motherhood again. 
It is wonderful indeed, and I find it often noted in the red volumes, how in retirement the longing rises for events and exploits, for experiences and enjoyments, and again in the midst of the latter for solitude and tranquillity. We kept ourselves apart from the great world. We had merely paid a visit to the house of our ambassador, Metternich, and let it be known there that on account of our domestic afflictions we did not desire any entrée into court circles or society. On the other hand, we sought to make the acquaintance of a few prominent political and literary personages, partly from self-interest and for our mental improvement, partly with a view to the service into which Frederick had entered. In spite of the slight hopes he had of any perceptible results from his efforts, he never allowed it to escape him, and he put himself into communication with numerous influential persons from whom he might gain assistance in his career, or at least information as to its position. We had at that time commenced a little book of our own. We called it The Protocol of Peace, into which all news, notices, articles, and so forth bearing on the subject were to be sedulously entered. The history also of the idea of peace, as far as we could gain a knowledge of it, was incorporated into the protocol, and along with this the expressions of various philosophers, poets, priests, and authors on the subject of peace and war. It had soon grown into an imposing little volume, and in course of time, for I have carried on this composition down to the present day, it has grown into several little volumes. If one were to compare it with the libraries, which are filled with works on strategical subjects, with the untold thousands of volumes containing histories of wars, studies on war, and glorification of war, with the textbooks of military science and military tactics and guides for the instruction of recruits and artillery, with the chronicles of battle and annals of état-major, soldiers' ballads and war songs, well then, I allow that the comparison with these one or two poor little volumes of peace literature might humiliate one on the assumption that one might measure the power and value, especially the future value, of a thing by its size. But if one reflects that a single grain of seed hides in itself the virtual power of causing the growth of an entire forest, which will displace whole masses of weeds through spread over acres of country, and further reflects that an idea is in the mental kingdom what a seed is in the vegetable, then one need not be anxious about the future of an idea, merely because the history of its development may be as yet contained in one little manuscript. I will here produce a few extracts taken from our Protocol of Peace for the year 1867. On the first page was placed a compressed historical survey. Quote, Four hundred years before Christ, Aristophanes wrote a comedy, Peace, into which a humanitarian tendency enters. The Greek philosophy, afterwards transplanted to Rome, admitted a striving after the unity of humanity from Socrates, who called himself a citizen of the world down to Terence, to whom nothing human was foreign, and Cicero, who represents the love of the human race as the highest grade of perfection. In the first century of our era appears Virgil, with his famous fourth eclogue, which prophecies universal peace to the world under the mythological image of the return of the Golden Age. In the Middle Ages, the popes often strove, though in vain, to interpose as arbitrators between states. In the 15th century, the idea occurred to a king of forming a League of Peace. This was Georges Podibrat of Bohemia, who wished to put an end to the wars of the emperor and the pope. For this purpose, he betook himself to King Louis XVI of France, who, however, did not fall in with the proposal. At the close of the 16th century, King Henry IV of France conceived the plan of a European confederation of states. After he had delivered his country from the horrors of the religious war, he wished to see toleration and peace assured for all future time. He wished to see the 16 states of which Europe then consisted, for Russia and Turkey were reckoned parts of Asia combined into a bunt. Each of these sixteen states was to have the right of sending two members to a European council, and to this council, consisting thus of thirty-two members, the task was to be entrusted of maintaining the religious peace and avoiding all international conflicts, and then if every state would bind itself to submit to the decisions of the council, every element of European wars would be thereby removed. The king communicated this plan to his minister, Sully, who heartily accepted it and straightway commenced negotiations with the other states. 
Elizabeth of England, the Pope, Holland, and several others were actually won over. Only the House of Austria would have offered resistance, because territorial concessions might have been demanded from her, which she would not have granted. A campaign would have been necessary to overcome this resistance. France would have contributed the main army, and she would have renounced beforehand any extension of territory, the sole aim of the campaign and the sole condition of peace imposed on the House of Austria, would have been their entrance into the League of States. All the preparations were already completed, and Henry IV meant to take the command of the army in person, when on May 13, 1610, he fell under the dagger of an insane monk. None of his successors nor any other sovereign took up again this glorious plan for procuring happiness for the nations. Rulers and politicians remained true to the old war spirit, but the thinkers of all countries did not allow the idea of peace to fall to the ground again. In the year 1647, the sect of the Quakers was founded, and the condemnation of war was its fundamental principle. In the same year, William Penn published his work on the future peace of Europe, which he founded on the plan of Henry IV. In the early part of the 18th century appeared the famous book of the Abbé de Saint-Pierre, entitled La Paix Perpetuelle. At the same time, a landgrave of Hesse sketched out the same plan, and Leibniz wrote a favorable comment on it. Voltaire gave out the maxim, quote, Every European war is a civil war, unquote. Mirabeau, in the memorable session of August 25, 1790, spoke the following words, quote, The moment is perhaps not far off now when freedom, as the unfettered monarch of both worlds, will fulfill the wish of philosophers to free mankind from the sin of war and proclaim universal peace. Then will the happiness of the people be the only aim of the legislator, the only glory of the nations. Unquote. In the year 1795, one of the greatest thinkers of all time, Immanuel Kant, wrote his treatise on eternal peace. The English publicist Bentham joins with enthusiasm the ever-increasing number of the defenders of peace, Fourier, Saint-Simon, etc. Béranger sang The Holy Alliance of Peace, La Martine, La Marseillaise de la Paix. In Geneva, Count Salon founded a peace club, in whose name he entered into a propagandist correspondence with all the rulers of Europe. From Massachusetts in America comes the learned blacksmith, Elihu Burritt, and scatters his olive leaves and sparks from an anvil about the world in millions of copies, and takes the chair in 1849 at an assembly of the English Friends of Peace. In the Congress of Paris, which wound up the Crimean War, the idea of peace gained a footing in diplomacy, inasmuch as a clause was added to the treaty which provided that the powers pledged themselves in future conflicts to submit themselves previously to mediation. This clause contains in itself a recognition of the principle of a court of arbitration, but it has not been acted upon. In the year 1863, the French government proposed to the powers to call a congress, before which was to be brought the consideration of proposals for a general disarmament and for the avoidance of future wars. End quote. But this proposal found no support whatever from the other governments. End of section 67, read by Sandra. Section 68 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lay Down Your Arms by Berta von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 16, Part 3. And now my hour of trial was again drawing nigh but it was so different this time from that other in which Frederick had to leave me to fight for the Augustenberger. This time he was at my side, the husband's proper post, diminishing through his presence and through his sympathy the sufferings of his wife. The feeling that I had him there was to me so calming and so happy that in it I almost forgot my physical discomfort. A girl. It was the fulfillment of my silent hope. The joys connected with the sun had already been given to us by my little Rudolph. We could now, in addition to these, taste those joys which such a fine little daughter promised to her parents. That this little Sylvia of ours would grow into a paragon of beauty, grace, and comeliness, we did not doubt for a single moment. How childish we both of us became over the cradle of this child! 
What sweet fooleries we spoke and acted there, I will not even try to tell. Others than fond parents would not understand it, and all of them have no doubt been just as silly themselves. But how selfish happiness makes us! There came now a time for us, in which we really were far too forgetful of everything which lay outside of our domestic heaven. The terrors of the cholera week kept taking always more and more in my memory the shape of a vanished evil dream, and even Frederick's energy in the pursuit of his aim gradually abated. And it was no doubt discouraging, wherever one knocked at any doors with these ideas, to meet with shrugs of shoulders, compassionate smiles, if not a regular setting to rights. The world, as it seems, is fond not only of being cheated, but also of being made miserable. Wherever one tries to put forward any proposals for removing misery and woe, they are called utopian, a childish dream, and the world will not listen to them. Still Frederick did not let his aim fall quite out of sight. He plunged ever deeper into the study of international law, and got into correspondence by letter with Blunchley and other men learned in his branch. At the same time, and here with my companionship, he diligently followed other studies, chiefly natural science. He formed a plan for writing a great work on war and peace, but before setting to work on it, he wanted to prepare himself for it and instruct himself by long and comprehensive researches. I am, it is true, he said, an old royal and imperial colonel, and it would shame most of my equals in rank and age to dip into schooling. When one is an elderly man of office and rank, one thinks oneself usually clever enough to act independently. I myself a few years since had that respect for my own individuality, but when I had suddenly attained to a new point of view in which I got an insight into the modern spirit, then the consciousness of my want of knowledge came over me. Oh, yes, of all the gains that have now been made in the matter of new discoveries in all provinces of knowledge, there was nothing at all taught in my youth, or rather the reverse was taught, so I must now, in spite of the streaks of grey on my temples, begin again at the beginning. The winter after Sylvie's birth we spent at Vienna in perfect quiet. Next spring we travelled to Italy. To travel and make acquaintance with the world was indeed a part of our new programme of life. We were independent and rich, and nothing hindered us from carrying it out. Small children are a little troublesome in travelling, but if one can take about a sufficient train of bun and nurses, the thing can be done. I had taken into my establishment an old servant who had once been nurse to me and my sisters, and then had married an hotel steward, and now was left a widow. This Mr. Sanna was worthy of my fullest confidence, and in her hands I could leave my little Sylvia at home with perfect security at any time when we, i.e. Frederick and I, left our headquarters for several days on some excursion. Rudolph would have been just as well seen after by Mr. Foster, his tutor, but it often happened that we took the little eight-year-old boy with us. Happy, happy times. Pity that I then neglected the red books so much. It was exactly at this time that I might have entered so much that was beautiful, interesting, and gay. But I neglected it, and so the details of that year have mostly faded out of my recollection. It is only in rough outline that I can now recall a picture of it. In the Protocol of Peace I did find an opportunity to make a gratifying entry. This was a leading article signed B. de Moulin, in which the proposal was made to the French government that it should put itself at the head of the European states by giving them the example of disarmament. Quote, in this way, France will make herself sure of the alliance and of the honest friendship of all states, which will then have ceased to be afraid of France, while they would desire her sympathy. In this way, the general disarmament would commence spontaneously, the principle of conquest would be given up for ever, and the Confederation of States would quite naturally form a court of international law, which would be in a position to settle in the way of arbitration all disputes which could never be decided by war. In so acting, France would have gained over to her side the only real and only lasting power, namely right, and would have opened for humanity in the most glorious manner a new era. From Opinion Nationale, July twenty fifth, eighteen sixty eight. Unquote. This article, of course, got no attention. In the winter of eighteen sixty eight to sixty nine, we went back to Paris, and this time, for we wished to make acquaintance with life, we plunged into the great world. It was rather a tiring process, but yet, for a time, it was very pleasant. In order to have some home, we had hired a small residence in the quarter of the Champs-Élysées, whither we could also sometimes invite in turn our numerous acquaintance, by whom we were invited every day to a party of some kind or another. 
Having been introduced by our ambassador at the court of the Tuileries, we were invited for the whole winter to the Mondays of the Empress, and besides this the houses of all the ambassadors were open to us as well as the salon of Princess Mathilde, the Duchess of Mouchy, Queen Isabella of Spain, and so on. We made the acquaintance also of many literary magnates, not of the greatest, however, I mean Victor Hugo, as he was living in exile. But we met Renan, Dumas père et fils, Octave Feuillet, George Sand, Arsène Housset, and some others. At the house of the last named we also were present at a masked ball, when the author of the Grande Dame gave one of his Venetian fight in his splendid little hotel on the Avenue Friedland. It was the custom that the real Grande Dame should go there under the protection of their masks, along with the little ladies, well-known actresses, and so forth, who were making their diamonds and their wit sparkle there. We were also very industrious visitors to the theatres. At least three times a week we spent our evenings either at the Italian opera, where Adelina Patti, just married to the Marquis de Caux, was enchanting the audience, or at the Théâtre Français, or even at one of the little boulevard theatres to see Hortense Schneider as the Grand Duchess of Gerolstein, or some of the other celebrities of operetta or vaudeville. It is wonderful, however, how, when one is once plunged into this whirl of splendor and entertainments, this little great world appears to one all of a sudden so terribly important, and the laws which prevail therein of elegance and chic, it was even then called chic, as laying on one a kind of solemnly undertaken duty. To take at the theater a less distinguished place than a stage-box, to appear in the bois with a carriage whose equipage should not be faultless, to go to a court ball without putting on a toilette of two thousand francs signed by worth, to sit down to table, Madame la Baronne et Servie, even if one had no guests, without having the finest dishes and the choicest wines served by the solemn maître d'hôtel in person, and several lackeys, all these would have been serious offences. How easy, how very easy it comes to one, when one is caught up in the machinery of such an existence as this, to spend all one's thoughts and feelings on this business, which is really devoid of all thought and feeling, and in doing this to forget to take any part in the progress of the real world outside, I mean the universe, or in the condition of one's own world within, I mean domestic bliss. This is what might perhaps have happened to me, but Frederick preserved me from it. He was not the man to allow himself to be torn away and smothered by the whirlpool of Parisian high life. He did not forget, in the world in which we were moving, either the universe or our own hearth. An hour or two in the morning we still kept, devoted to reading and domestic life, and so we accomplished the great feat of enjoying happiness even in the midst of pleasure. For us Austrians, there was much sympathy cherished at Paris. In political conversations there was often a talk about la revanche de Sadova, certainly in the sense that the injustice done to us two years before was to be made good again, as if anything of that sort could make it good again. If blows are only to be wiped out by fresh blows, then surely the thing can never cease. It was just to my husband and me, because he had been in the army and had served the campaign in Bohemia, it was just to us that people thought they could say something more polite or more agreeable than a hopeful allusion to the Ravanche de Sadova, which was in prospect, and which was already treated of as an historical event which would assure the European equilibrium, and was itself ensured by diplomatic arrangements. A slap to be administered to the Prussians on the next opportunity was a necessity in the school discipline of the nations. Nothing tragical would come of the matter, only enough to check the arrogance of certain folks. Perhaps even the whip hanging up on the wall would be enough for this purpose, but if that arrogant fellow should try any of his saucy tricks, he had received fair warning that it would come down upon him in the shape of the Ravanche de Sadova. We, of course, decisively put aside all such consolations. A former misfortune was not to be conjured away by a fresh misfortune, nor an old injustice to be atoned for by a new injustice. We assured our friends that we wished for nothing, except that we might never see the present peace broken again. This was also essentially the wish of Napoleon III. We had so much intercourse with persons whose position was quite close to the emperor, that we had plenty of opportunities of becoming acquainted with his political views, as he gave utterance to them in his confidential conversation. 
It was not only that he wished for peace at the moment, he cherished the plan of proposing to the powers a general disarmament, but for the moment he did not feel his own domestic position in the country secure enough to carry this plan out. There was great discontent boiling and seething among the populace, and in the circle immediately surrounding the throne there was a party which laboured to represent to him that his throne could only be rendered secure by a successful foreign war just a little triumphal promenade to the rhine and the splendour and stability of the napoleonic dynasty were secured il faut faire grand was the advice of his councillors that the war which was in prospect the year before on the luxembourg question had come to nothing and was displeasing to them the preparations on both sides had gone on so grandly and then the matter had been adjourned but in the long run a fight between france and prussia was certainly inevitable they were incessantly urging on further in this direction but only a feeble echo of these matters came to us one is accustomed to hear that sort of thing resounding in the journals as regularly as the breakers on the shore there is no occasion to fear a storm on that account you listen quite tranquilly to the band which is playing its lively airs on the beach the breakers form only a soft unheeded bass accompaniment to them this brilliant way of life, only too overburdened with pleasure, reached its highest pitch in the spring months. At that time there were added long drives in the bois, in open carriages, numerous picture exhibitions, garden parties, horse races, picnics, and with all this no fewer theatres, or visits, or dinner, or evening parties, than in the depth of winter. We then began to long much for repose. In fact, this sort of life has never its true attraction, except when some flirtation or love affair is combined with it girls who are in search of a husband, women who want a lover, or men who are in search of adventures. For these, every new fight, where it is possible they may meet the object of their dream, possesses a new interest. But for Frederick and me, that I was inflexibly true to my lord, that I never by a single glance gave any one the occasion to approach me with any audacious hopes, I may say without any pride of virtue, it was a mere matter of course. Whether under different relations I should have also resisted all the temptations to which, in such a whirl of pleasure, pretty young ladies are exposed, is more than I can say. But when one carries in one's heart a love so deep and so full of bliss, as I held for my Frederick, one is surely armed against all danger. And as far as he was concerned, was he true to me? I can only say that I never felt any doubt about it. When the summer had returned to the land, when the Grand Prix was over, and the different members of society began to quit Paris, some to Trouville or Dieppe, Biarritz or Vichy, others to Baden-Baden, and a third set to their château, Princess Mathilde to saint gratien and the court to Compiègne, then we were besieged with requests to select the same destinations for travel, and with invitations to country homes, but we were decidedly indisposed to prolong the campaign of luxury and pleasure which we had carried out in the winter, into a summer one also. I did not wish to return at once to Gromitz. I feared too much the reawakening of painful memories. Besides, we should not have found there the solitude we desired, on account of our numerous relations and neighbours. So we chose once more for a resting place, a quiet corner of Switzerland. We promised our friends in Paris that we should come back next winter, and went on our summer tour with the joy of schoolboys going for their holidays. Now succeeded a time of real refreshment, long walks, long hours of study, long hours of play with the children, and no entries in the red volumes, which last was a sign of freedom from care and spiritual peace. Europe also seemed at that time tolerably free from care and peaceful. At least no black spots were anywhere visible. One did not even hear any more talk about the famous Revanche de Sadova. The greatest trouble which I experienced at that time was caused by the universal obligation for defence, which had been introduced a year before amongst us Austrians, that my Rudolf some time or other must become a soldier. That was a thing I could not bear. And yet folks dream of freedom. Frederick tried to comfort me. A year of volunteering is not much. I shook my head. Even if it were but a day, no man ought to be compelled to take upon himself a certain office, which perhaps he hates, even for a single day, for during that day he must make a show of the opposite of what he feels, must pretend that he's doing joyfully what he really hates. In short, he's obliged to lie, and I wanted to bring up my son to be true before all things. Then he ought to have been born one or two centuries later, my dearest, replied Frederick. It is only the perfectly free man who can be perfectly true, and we are still poorly off for both things, 
freedom, and truth in our days, that becomes clearer and clearer to me the deeper I plunge into my studies. Now, in this retirement, Frederick had twice the leisure for his work, and he set about it with true ardour. However happy and content we were with our life in this solitude, still we remained firm in our determination to spend next winter in Paris again. This time, however, it was not with the view of amusing ourselves, but in order to do something practical towards the fulfilment of the task of our lives. In this, it is true, we did not cherish any confidence that we should attain anything, but when a man sees even the possibility of the shadow of a chance offered him to contribute anything towards a cause which he recognizes as the holiest cause on earth, he feels it to be a duty which he cannot refuse to try this chance. Now, in recapitulating, during our familiar talks, the recollections of Paris, we had thought also of that plan of the Emperor Napoleon which had come to our ears by the communications of his confidence. I mean the plan for proposing disarmament to the great powers. It was on this that we based our hopes and our projects. Frederick's researches had brought into his hand Sully's memoirs, in which the plan of Henry IV for peace is described in all its details. We meant to convey an abstract of this to the Emperor of the French, and at the same time to try, through our connections in Austria and Prussia, to prepare both these governments for the propositions of the French government. I could set this on foot by the means of minister, to be sure, and Frederick had, at Berlin, a relative who was in an influential political position and stood very well at court. In December, which was the time we meant to move to Paris, we were prevented. Our treasure, our little Sylvia, fell ill. What anxious hours those were! Napoleon III and Henry IV, of course, were then put in the background. Our child, dying. But she did not die. In two weeks all danger was over. Only the physician forbade us to travel during the worst of the winter's cold, so we put off our departure till March. This sickness and recovery, the danger and the preservation, what a shock they had given our hearts! And how much, though I thought that no longer possible, they had brought them more near to each other still. To tremble in unison before a horrid disaster, one which each fears the more from seeing the other's despair, and to weep tears of joy in common when this disaster has been averted, are things which have a most mighty influence in welding souls together. End of section 68 Read by Sandra in Montreal, 2021《Section 69 of Lay Down Your Arms》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lay Down Your Arms by Beata von Zutner Translated by Timothy Holmes Chapter 16, Part 4 Forebodings? No, there were none. If there had been, Paris would not have made on me the cheerful impression of promised pleasure which it did on one sunny afternoon of March 1870 on our arrival. One knows now what horrors were brooding over that city after a very short interval, but not the faintest anticipation of trouble arose in my mind. We had already hired beforehand, through the agent, John Arthur, the same little palace in which we had lived last year, and at its door was waiting for us our maitre d'hôtel of the previous year. As we drove across the Champs-Élysées to reach our dwelling, it was just the hour for the bois, and several of our old acquaintances met us and exchanged joyful recognitions. The numerous little barrows of violets which were dragged about the streets of Paris that year filled the air with a promise of spring. The sunbeams were sparkling and playing in rainbows on the fountains of the Rond-Point, making little reflections on the carriage lamps and the harness of the many carriages. Amongst others, the beautiful Empress was driving in a carriage harnessed à la Domon. She passed us, and, recognizing me, made a gesture of salutation. There are some special pictures or scenes which photograph or phonograph themselves in our memory, along with the feelings that accompany them, and some of the words that are spoken at them. This Paris is truly lovely, cried Frederick at this point, 
and my feeling was a childish self-congratulation on the coming treat. Had I known what was coming to me and to this whole city now bathed in splendor and rejoicing? This time we abstained from throwing ourselves, as we had done the year before, into the whirlpool of worldly amusements. We announced that we would not accept any dancing invitations and kept ourselves apart from the great receptions. Even the theatre we did not visit so often, only when some piece made a great impression. And so it came about that we spent most evenings at home alone or in the society of a few friends. As to our plans with regard to the idea of the emperor about disarmament, we got on but badly with them. Napoleon the Third had not indeed given up his idea altogether, but the present time, it was said, was not at all suited for carrying it out. In the circle around the throne a conviction had grown up that that throne stood on no very firm footing. A great discontent was boiling and seething among the people, in order to repress which all the police and censorship regulations were made more stringent and the only consequence of this was greater discontent. The only thing, said certain people, which could give renewed splendor and security to the dynasty would be a successful campaign. It is true there was no near prospect of this, but all mention of disarmament would be a total and complete mistake, for thereby the whole Bonaparte nimbus would be destroyed which was undoubtedly founded on the heritage of glory of the first Napoleon. We had also received no very cheering answers to our inquiries on these subjects from Prussia and Austria. There people had entered on an epoch of expansion of the defensive forces. The word army began to be unfashionable, and the word disarmament fell on this like a gross discord. On the contrary, in order to obtain the blessings of peace, the defensive power must be increased, the French were not to be trusted, the Russians neither, and the Italians most certainly not. They would fall on Trieste and Trent at once, if they had the opportunity. In short, the only thing to do was to nurse the Landwehr system with all the care possible. The time is not ripe, said Frederick on our receiving communications such as these, and I must, I suppose, in reason give up the hope that I personally may be able to help in hastening the ripening of that time, or even see the fruits I long for blossoming. What I can contribute is mean enough, but from the hour that I saw that this thing, however mean, is my duty, it has, in spite of all, become the greatest thing of all to me, so I keep on. But if, for the present, the project of disarmament had been dropped, I had yet one comfort. There was no war in sight. The war party which existed in the court and among the people, and whose opinion was that the dynasty must be rebaptized in blood, and that another little taste of glory must be provided for the people, were obliged to renounce their plan of attack and their bewitching little campaign on the Rhine frontier. For France possessed no allies. Great drought prevailed in the country. A dearth of forage was to be anticipated. The army horses had to be sold. There was no question in agitation, the contingent of recruits had been diminished by the legislative body. In short, so Olivia declared from the tribune, the peace of Europe is assured. Assured! I rejoiced over the word. It was repeated in all the papers, and many thousands rejoiced with me. For what can there be better for the majority of men than assured peace? How much, however, that security, which was announced by a statesman on June the 3rd, 1870, was worth, we now all know, and even at the time we might have known this much, that assurances of that kind from statesmen, though the public always receives them again with the same innocent trust, really contain no guarantee, literally none.
The European situation shows no question in agitation, therefore peace is secure. What feeble logic! Questions may come into agitation any moment. It is not till we have prepared some means against such a contingency other than war that we can ever be secure against war. End of section 69「Section 70 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 17, Part 1. We remain in Paris to get ready a new house. The question between France and Prussia candidature of prince hohenzollern for the crown of spain the war rumors and the speeches in the chamber become menacing the hohenzollern candidature withdrawn further demands of france threatening debate in the french chamber war declared excitement and enthusiasm in paris with which side should we sympathize the opposing manifestos we linger in paris Opinions about war of eminent French writers. Proclamations of the two armies. Secret history. Paris society again dispersed in all directions. We, however, remain behind on business, for an extraordinarily advantageous bargain had been offered to us through the sudden departure of an American. A little half-finished hotel in the Avenue de la Imperatrice had had to be offered for sale, and at a price which did not amount to much more than the sum already expended on the decoration and furnishing of the thing itself, as we had already the intention of spending in future some months of each year in Paris, and as the purchase in question was also at the same time an excellent bargain, we closed with it. We wished to superintend the completion ourselves, and for this purpose stopped in Paris. The decoration of one's own nest is, besides, such a pleasurable task that we willingly endured the unpleasantness of staying in the city the whole summer. Besides, we had plenty of houses to which we could resort for company. The Chateau of Prince Martil of St. Gratien, then Chateau Moshi, and the next Baron Rothschild's place, Ferrieres, and other summer residences, besides our acquaintance, were situated near Paris, and we arranged once or twice a week to pay a visit now to one of them, now to another. It was, I recollect, in the salon of Prince Matil that I first heard of the question that was soon to come into agitation. The company was sitting, after de Janour, on the terrace looking on to the park. Who were all the people there? I do not recollect them all now. Only two of the persons present remain in my memory, Taine and Renan. The conversation was a very lively one and I recollect that it was Renan chiefly who led the talk, sparkling with esprit and witticisms. The author of the Vie de Jesus is an example that a man may be incredibly ugly and yet exercise an incredible fascination. Now the talk turned upon politics. A candidate had been sought for the crown of Spain. A prince of Hohenzollern was to receive the crown. I had scarcely been listening, for what could the throne of Spain or he who was to sit upon it have to do with me or all these nonchalant folks here. But then someone said, A Hohenzollern, France would not permit that. The words cut me to the heart, for what did that not permit imply? When such an utterance comes from any country, one sees with one's mind's eye the statue personifying that country as a gigantic virgin, her head thrown back in defiance, her hand on her sword. The conversation, however, soon turned to another subject. How full of tremendous results this question of the Spanish throne would be, none of us yet suspected. I, of course, did not either. Only that arrogant France would not permit that, stuck in my memory like a discord, and along with it the whole scenery did so in which it was spoken. From that time the question of the Spanish throne became constantly more loud and more pressing, Every day the space became larger which it occupied in the newspapers and in conversations in the salons. 
and I know that it bored me to the highest degree, this Hohenzollern candidature. Soon there was nothing else spoken of, and it was spoken of in an offended tone, as if nothing more insulting to France could take place. Most people saw behind it a provocation to war on the part of Prussia, but it was clear, so it was said, that France could not permit such a thing. So, if the Hohenzollerns persisted in it, that is a simple challenge. I could not understand that, but in other respects I was free from anxiety. We received letters from Berlin, telling us from my well-instructed quarter that not the slightest importance was attached at court to the secession of the Hohenzollern to the Spanish crown, and therefore we were much more occupied with the work at our house than with politics. But gradually we became more attentive to the subject for all that, as before the storm a certain rustling of leaves goes through the forest, so before war a rustle of certain voices goes through the world. No rons la guerre, no rons la guerre, was what resounded in the air of Paris. Then an unspeakable anxiety possessed me, not for my own people, for we as Austrians were at first out of the game. On the contrary, we might possibly have some satisfaction offered to us, the well-known revenge for Sadawa. But we had untaught ourselves the habit of looking at war from a national point of view. And what war is from the point of view of humanity, of the highest humanity, is surely notorious. That is expressed in the following words, which I heard spoken by Guy de Maupassant. When je sens seulement à ces mots la guerre, il me vient un enfermement, comme si l'on me parlait de sorcellerie d'inquisition, d'une chose lointaine finie, abominable contre nature. When the news arrived that the crown had been offered by Prim to Prince Leopold, the Duke of Gromont made a speech in Parliament, which was received with great approbation, to the following effect. We do not meddle with the affairs of foreign nations, but we do not believe that respect for the rights of a neighboring state binds us to permit a foreign power, by seating one of its own princes on the throne of Charles V, to destroy to our detriment the equilibrium which exists between the states of Europe. Oh, that equilibrium, what war-loving hypocrite invented that hollow phrase, and so bring into danger the interests, the honors of France. I know a tale of George Sand, named Griboil. This Griboil has the peculiarity, when rain is threatened, of plunging into the river for fear of getting wet. Whenever I hear that war is contemplated in order to avert threatened dangers, I can never help thinking of Griboil. A whole branch of Hohenzollerns might very well have seated themselves on Charles V's throne, and many other thrones as well, without exposing the interests or the honor of France to one thousandth part of the damage that resulted to them from this bold we cannot permit it. The case, the speaker continued, will, as we most confidently believe, not occur. We reckon in this regard on the wisdom of the German and the friendship of the Spanish people, but if it should turn out otherwise, then, gentlemen, we, strong in our support and that of the nation, shall know how to do our duty without vacillation and without weakness. Loud applause. From that time began in the press the cry for war. It was Gerardim in particular who could not inflame his countrymen sufficiently to punish the unheard of audacity contained in this candidature for the throne. It would be unworthy of the dignity of France not to interpose her veto upon it. Prussia, it is true, would not give in, for she is bent, mad as she is, on conjuring up war. Intoxicated by her success of 1866, she believes that she may extend her march of victory and robbery on the Rhine also. But thank God we are ready to balk all these appetites of the Pickelhaubers. And so it went on in the same key. Napoleon the Third, it is true, as we found out through persons who were about him, still wished, as before, for the preservation of peace. But most of the people of his entourage now thought that a war was inevitable, that since, apart from all this, there was discontent among the people with the government. The best thing that could be done to secure the respect of the country, anxious as it was for glory, would be to carry out a successful war. Il faut faire grand and now inquiries were made of all the European cabinets about the situation. Each declared that they wished for peace. 
in germany a manifesto was published originating in popular articles signed by liebknecht amongst others wherein it was said the mere thought of a war between germany and france is a crime benedetti was sent with the charge of demanding from the king of prussia that he would forbid prince leopold to assume the crown king william was at that moment taking the waters at ems benedetti went there and got an audience on july ninth what would the result be i waited for the news with trembling the answer of the king simply said that he could not forbid anything to a prince who had attained adult years this sent the war party into triumphant joy there will you suffer that do they want to provoke us to the utmost that the head of the house cannot command or forbid anything to one of its members ridiculous it is clearly a made-up plot the hohenzollerns want to get a footing in spain and then fall upon our country from the east and south at once and are we to wait for that are we to be content to take with humility the utter disregard of our protest surely not we know what honor what patriotism commands us to do ever louder and louder ever more and more threatening sounded the storm warnings then on july twelfth came a piece of news which filled me with delight don salusto olizaga announced officially to the french government that prince leopold of hohenzollern in order not to give any pretext for war refused to assume the crown offered to him now thank god the entire question is thus simply put aside the news was communicated to the chamber at noon and oliver declared that this put an end to the dispute yet on the same day troops and war material were forwarded to metz publicly said to be in pursuance of previous orders and in the same sitting clement de vernois put the following question what securities have we that prussia will not originate fresh complications like this spanish candidature that should be provided against there griboil again comes up again it may happen perhaps at some time that a trifling rain may threaten to wet us so let us jump into the river at once and so benedetti was dispatched again to ems this time to demand of the king of prussia that he would forbid prince leopold once for all and for all future time to revive his candidature what could follow such an attempt at dictating a course of action which the party on whom the demand is made is not competent to carry out except an impatient shrug of the shoulders those who made the demand must have known as much there was another memorable sitting on july fifteenth oliver demanded a credit of five hundred million francs for the war there is opposed it oliver replied he took on himself to justify before the bar of history what had been done the king of prussia had refused to receive the french envoy and had notified this to the government in a letter the left wanted to see this letter the majority forbade by clamor and by a counter vote the production of the document which probably had no existence this majority supported any demand made by the government in favor of the war this patriotic readiness for sacrifice which would accept even ruin without hesitation was of course again applauded becomingly with the usual ready-made terms of sentence july sixteenth england made attempts to prevent the war in vain ah if there had been an arbitration court established how easily and simply might such a trivial dispute have been decided july nineteenth the french chars d'affaires in berlin handed the prussian government the declaration of war three words which can be pronounced quite calmly but what is connected with them the beginning of an extra political action and thus along with it half a million sentences of death this document also entered into the red volumes it runs thus the government of his majesty the emperor of the french could not regard the design of raising a prussian prince to the throne of spain otherwise than as an attack on the territorial security of france and has therefore found itself compelled to request from his majesty the king of prussia the assurance that such a combination should never again occur with his consent as his majesty refuses any such assurance and has on the contrary declared to our ambassador that he must reserve to himself the possibilities of such an event and inquire into the circumstances the imperial government cannot help recognizing this declaration of the king an arrière pensee which for france and for the european equilibrium 
there it comes again this famous equilibrium look at this shelf and the precious china on it it is tottering the dishes may fall so let us smash it down this declaration has assumed a still graver character from the communication which has been made to the cabinet of the refusal to receive the emperor's ambassador and to introduce in common with him a new method of solution so by such things as these by a more or less friendly conversation between rulers and diplomatists the fate of nations may be decided in consequence of this the french government has thought it its duty without delay to think of the defence yes yes defence never attack of its outraged dignity and its outraged interests and being determined to employ for that and all means which are offered by the position which has been imposed upon it regards itself from this time forward as in a state of war with prussia state of war does the man think who puts these words on paper on the green cloth of his writing table that he is plunging his pen in flames in tears of blood in the poison of plague and so the storm is unchanged this time on account of a king being sought for a vacant throne and as the consequence of a negotiation undertaken between two monarchs must kant then be right in his first definitive condition for everlasting peace the civil constitution in every state should be republican to be sure the effect of this article would be to remove many causes of war for history shows how many campaigns have been undertaken for dynastic questions and the whole establishment of monarchical power rests assuredly on successful conduct of war still republics also are warlike it is the spirit the old savage spirit which lights up hatred lust of plunder and ambition of conquest in peoples whether governed in one form or another i recollect what an altogether peculiar humour seized me at this time when the franco-german war was in preparation and then broke out the stormy sultrines before the howling tempest after its declaration the whole population was in a fever and who can keep himself aloof from such an epidemic naturally according to old custom the beginning of the campaign was at once looked on as a triumphal procession that is no more than patriotic duty ah berlin ah berlin was shouted through the streets and from the outside of the omnibuses the marseillaise at every street corner le jour de gloire est arrive at every theatrical representation the first actress or singer at the start at the opera it was marie sas had to come before the curtain in a jean d'arc costume waving a flag and sing this battle song which was received by the audience standing in which they often joined we also were among the spectators one evening frederick and i and we also had to rise from our seats i say i had to not from any external pressure for we could of course have withdrawn to the back of the box but had to because we were electrified look martha frederick explained to me a spark like that which runs from one man to another and makes this whole mass rise to one united and excited heartbeat that is love what do you mean it is surely a song of hatred that their unholy blood may sink into our furrows that is no matter united hatred also is one form of love wherever two or more unite in one common feeling they love each other let but a higher conception than that of the nation i e of mankind and of humanity once more be seized as the general idea and then ah i sighed when will that be when that is a very relative term in regard to the duration of our life never in regard to that of our race tomorrow end of section seventy section seventy one of lay down your arms this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner Translated by Timothy Holmes Chapter 17, Part Number 2 When war has broken out, all the subjects of neutral states divide themselves into two camps. One takes the side of the one, the other of the opposite party. It is like a great fluctuating wager in which everyone has a share. 
we too frederick and i with which side should we sympathize with which to conquer as austrians we should have been fully justified patriotically in wishing to see our victor in the former war vanquished in this one besides it is again natural that one should give the greater sympathy to those in whose midst one is living and with whose feelings one is involuntarily infected and we were then surrounded by the french still frederick was of prussian descent and were we not more allied with the germans whose speech even was my own than with their adversaries beside had not the declaration of war proceeded from the french on such trifling grounds nay not grounds but pretexts and must we not conclude from it that the prussians cause was the more just one and that they were going to battle only as defenders and in obedience to compulsion king william had spoken with much justice in his speech from the throne on july nineteenth the german and the french nations both enjoying equally the blessings of christian training and increasing prosperity have been called to a more holy strife than the bloody one of arms the rulers of france however have tried to make profit for their own personal interests and passions out of the justifiable but irritable self-consciousness of our great neighbor by means of deliberate deception the emperor napoleon on his side published the following proclamation in view of the presumptuous pretensions of prussia we were obliged to make protests these were treated with scorn transactions followed which showed their contempt for us our country has been deeply irritated at this and at present the cry for war resounds from one end of france to the other there remains nothing possible for us except to trust our fate to the arbitrament of arms we are not making war on germany whose independence we respect it is the object of our best wishes that the people composing the great german nationality should dispose freely of their own fate as far as concerns ourselves we desire to set up a state of things which will guarantee our security and make our future safe we wish to obtain a lasting peace founded on the true interests of the peoples we wish for the termination of this miserable situation in which all the nations are expending their resources and arming on all sides against each other what a lesson what a mighty lesson speaks for this writing when compared with the events which ensued upon it this campaign then was undertaken by france in order to attain security to attain lasting peace and what came of it l'année terrible in lasting enmity enmity which still prevails no as with coal you cannot whitewash as with asaphotia you cannot diffuse a sweet perfume so neither with war can you make peace secure this miserable situation to which napoleon alludes how much has it not changed for the worse since then the emperor was in earnest though in earnest about the scheme for setting on foot a european disarmament i have it quite certainly from his nearest relations but the war party put pressure on him coerced him and he yielded and yet he could not refrain even in the war proclamation from harping on his favorite idea its carrying out was only to be deferred after the campaign after the victory said he to console himself it turned out otherwise so on which side were our sympathies if one has got to the point of detesting all war in and for itself as was the case with frederick and me the genuine pure passionate attachment to either side can exist no more one's only feeling is oh that it had never begun this campaign oh that it were only already over i did not think that the existing war would last long or have important consequences two or three battles one here and there and then there would be parleys for certain and the thing would be brought to an end what were they really fighting for literally for nothing the whole thing was more of an armed promenade undertaken by the french from love of knightly adventure by the germans from brave feelings of defensive duty few sabre cuts would be exchanged and the adversaries would shake hands again fool that i was as if the consequences of war remained in any proportion to the causes which produced it it is its course which determines its consequences we should have been glad to leave paris 
for all the enthusiasm which the whole population displayed produced the most painful effect on us but the way eastward was barred for the present and the business of our house building detained us in short we stayed we had hardly any society connections left everybody that could anyhow do so had fled from paris and even of those who remained no one under present circumstances even thought of issuing invitations a few however of our acquaintances among the literary circles who were still in the city we did frequently visit just at this phase of the commencing war it interested frederick to make himself acquainted with the judgments and views that then entertained by the master spirits of the time there was an author then quite young who later on attained much fame guy de maupassant some of whose utterances which penetrated into my soul i entered into the red volumes war if i only think of the word a horror comes over me as if people were talking to me about witches about the inquisition about some faraway overmastering horrible unnatural thing war to fight each other strangle cut each other to pieces and we have amongst us at this day in our times with our culture with such an extension of science with so high a grade of development as we believe ourselves to have attained we have schools where people are taught to kill to kill at a good distance and a good round number at a time what is wonderful is that the people do not rise up against it that the whole of society does not revolt at the bare word war every man who governs is just as much bound to avoid war as a ship's captain is bound to avoid shipwreck if a captain has lost a ship he is brought before a court and tried so that it may be known whether he has been guilty of negligence why should not a government be put on its trial whenever a war has been declared the people understood it they refused to allow themselves to be killed without cause there would be an end of war i had also an opportunity of reading a letter written by gustave flaubert to george sand in the early days of july just after the outbreak of the war here it is i am in despair at the stupidity of my countrymen the incorrigible barbarity of men fills me with deep grief this enthusiasm which is inspired by no idea makes me wish to die in order to see no more of it these good frenchmen wish to fight one because they believe themselves challenged by prussia two because savagery is the natural state of man three because war has an element of mystery in it which is alluring to man are we coming to indiscriminate fighting i fear it the horrible battles which are in preparation have no pretext whatever for them it is the love of fighting for fighting's sake i lament for the bridges and tunnels blown up all this human labor gone to ruin you will have seen that a gentleman recommended in the chamber the plundering of the grand duchy of baden oh that i could be with the bedouins oh cried i as i read this letter that we could have been born five hundred years later that would be even better than the bedouins men will not want all that time to become reasonable said frederick confidently End of section seventy one Section seventy two of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Sutna. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter seventeen, part three. The period of proclamations and general orders was now come the old humdrum tune again always and always again the public carried away to give it support and enthusiasm there was joy over the victories guaranteed in the manifestos just as if they had been gained already on july twenty eighth napoleon the third issued the following document from his headquarters at metz this also i entered into my book not indeed because i shared in the admiration but from contempt for the everlasting sameness and hollowness of its phrase-mongering we are defending the honor and the soil of our country we shall conquer nothing is too much for the persevering exertions of the soldiers of africa 
the crimea china italy and mexico once more you will show what a french army can do which is on fire with the love of country whatever way we take out of our boundaries we find there the glorious footsteps of our forefathers we will show ourselves worthy of them on our success depends the fate of freedom and civilizations soldiers let every one do his duty and the god of battles will be with us of course les deux des armes could not be left out that the leaders of defeated armies have said the same thing a hundred times over does not prevent the others from saying the same words at the beginning of every new campaign and awakening the same confidence by doing so is there anything more short and more weak than the memory of the people on july thirty first king william quitted berlin and left the following writing in going to-day to the army to fight along with it for honor and for the preservation of our noblest possessions I leave an amnesty for all political offenders. My people know as well as I that the breach of treaty and hostile proceedings are not on our side, but as we have been provoked, we are determined, like our fathers, and in firm reliance on God, to brave the battle for the deliverance of our fatherland. Necessity of defense, necessity of defense, that is the only recognized way of killing and so both parties cry out i am defending myself is not that a contradiction not altogether for over both there presides a third power the power of the conquering ancient war spirit it is only against him that all should join in a defensive league along with the above manifestos i find in my red volumes an entry with the singular title written over it if oliver had married Meyerbeer's daughter would the war have broken out this is how the matter stood amongst our parisian acquaintance there was a literary man named alexander weil and it was he who threw out the above question while he told us the following story meyerbeer was looking out for a man of talent for his second daughter and his choice fell on my friend emile oliver oliver was a widower he had married for his first wife the daughter of liszt whom the renowned pianist had by the countenance de Gault, Daniel Stern, with whom he long lived as his wife. The marriage was very happy, and Oliver had the reputation of a virtuous husband. He possessed no fortune, but as a speaker and statesman he was already famous. Meyerbeer wanted to make his personal acquaintance, and to this end I gave in April 1864 a great ball which was attended by most of the celebrities of art and science and where of course oliver who had been informed by me of meyerbeer's purpose played the first part he pleased meyerbeer the matter was not easy to bring to a head meyerbeer knew the independent originality of his second daughter who would never marry any other husband than one of her own choice meyerbeer arranged that oliver should pay a visit to Baden and there be introduced as if by chance to the young lady when meyerbeer died suddenly a fortnight after this ball it was oliver if you recollect who pronounced his elogie and funeral oration at the northern railway station now i affirm nay i am certain of it that if oliver had married meyerbeer's daughter the war between france and germany would not have broken out look how plausible my proofs are in the first place meyerbeer who hated the empire to the point of contempt would never have permitted his daughter's husband to become a minister of the emperor it is well known that if oliver had threatened the chamber to give in his resignation sooner than declare war the chamber would never have declared war the present war is the work of three backstairs confidants and secret ministers of the empress named jerome david paul de Cassagnac and the duc de gramont the empress excited by the pope whose religious puppet she is would have this war as to the success of which she never doubted in order to ensure her son's secession she said c'est ma guerre à mon et à mon fils and the three above papal anabaptists were her secret tools to force the emperor who did not want any war and the chamber into war by false and secret dispatches from germany and this is what is called diplomacy i interrupted with a shudder listen further pursued alexander wheel 
Oliver said to me on July 15th, when I met him on the Place de la Concorde, Peace is assured, or I resign. Whence came it then that the same man a few days later, instead of resigning, declared war himself, de un corps léger, as he said in the chamber? With a light heart, I cried, shuddering again. There is a secret in this that I can throw light upon. The emperor, for whom money had never any other value than to purchase love or friendship with it, he believes like Jugurtha in Rome that all in France, men and women, have their price as the custom when he takes a minister who is not rich of binding him more closely to himself by a present of a million francs daru alone who told me the secret declined this present timeo danejos et dona ferentes and he alone being unfettered sent in his resignation as long as the emperor hesitated oliver being bound to his master by this chain of gold declared himself neutral rather inclined to peace but as soon as the emperor had been overborne by his wife and her three ultramontane anabaptists oliver declared for war and gave it lively utterance with light heart and with full pockets end of section seventy two section seventy three of lay down your arms this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha Von Suttner, translated by Timothy Holmes, Chapter 18, Part 1. First Days of the War in Paris, Constant Reverses of the French Arms, Fall of Metz, Paris Turned into a Fortress, The Prussians Expelled from Paris, Surrender of the Emperor Napoleon and His Army at Sedan, proclamation of the republic feudal negotiations for peace we determined to quit paris this is prevented by my illness when i recovered the winter has set in and paris has long been beleaguered fall of strasbourg paris bombarded the proclamation of the german empire at versailles dreams of release and future happiness suddenly interrupted by the arrest and execution of my husband by the communards oh monsieur oh madame what happiness what great news with these words frederick's valet rushed into our room one day and the cook after him it was the day of worth what is it a telegram has been posted up at the bourse we have conquered the king of prussia's army is as good as annihilated the city is adorning itself with tricolor flags there will be an illumination tonight but in the course of the afternoon it turned out that the news was false a borse trick olivier made a speech to the crowd from his balcony well so much the better at least one would not be obliged to illuminate these joyful tidings of armies annihilated that is of numberless lives torn asunder and hearts broken awoke again in me too the same wish as flaubert's oh that i were with the bedouins on august seven news of a catastrophe the emperor hastened from St. Cloud to the theater of war. The enemy had penetrated into the country. The newspapers could not give expression hot enough to their rage at the invasion. The cry, Ah, Berlin, as it seemed to me, pointed to an intended invasion, but in that there was nothing to cause anger. But that these eastern barbarians should venture to make an incursion into beautiful, God-loved France, that was sheer savagery and sin. That must be stopped and quickly, too. The Minister of War, ad interim, published a decree that all citizens fit for service from the age of thirty to forty who did not belong to the National Guard should be immediately enrolled in that body. A Ministry of Defense of the country was formed. The war loan of five hundred millions which had been voted was raised to a thousand. It is quite refreshing to see how freely people always offer up the money and the lives of others. A trifling financial unpleasantness, to be sure, was soon perceptible to the public. If one wanted to change banknotes, one had to pay the money changer ten per cent. There was not gold at hand to meet all the notes which the Bank of France was authorized to issue. And now, victory after victory on the German side. The physiognomy of the city of Paris and its inhabitants altered. Instead of its proud, magnificent, resplendent mood came confusion and savage indignation. The feeling spread ever wider and wider that a horde of vandals had descended onto the land, 
something terrible, unheard of, like some cloud of locusts or some natural portent, that they themselves brought this plague on themselves by their declaration of war, that they had considered such a declaration indispensable in order that no Hohenzollern, even in the distant future, should even conceive the idea of succeeding to the Spanish throne, all that they had forgotten. Hideous tales were circulated about the enemy. The Uhlans, the Uhlans! These words had a fantastically demoniacal sound, as if one had said the horde of savages. In the imagination of the people, this kind of troops assumed a demoniacal shape. Wherever a bold stroke was executed by the German cavalry, it was attributed to the Uhlans, a kind of half-men, getting no pay, and therefore bound to live on their plunder. Along with the rumors of terror arose rumors also of triumph. To tell lies about successes is one of the duties of chauvinism, of course, because courage must be kept up. The command, to tell truth, like so many other commands, loses its obligation in wartime. Frederick dictated to me the following passage out of the newspaper La Volontaire for my red book. Up to the 16th of August, the Germans have lost already 144,000 men. The rest are almost starving. The last reserves are coming up from Germany. La Landwehr et la La Sturm, old men of 60, with flint muskets, with an enormous tobacco pouch on their right side, and a still larger schnapps flask on their left a long clay pipe in their mouth, stooping under the weight of the knapsack, on the top of which there must not be omitted the coffee mill and the elder tea inside, are crawling along, coughing and blowing their noses from the right to the left bank of the Rhine, cursing those who have torn them from the embraces of their grandchildren to lead them on to certain death. As to the news of victory brought from German sources, it was said in the French newspapers, they are the usual Prussian lies. On August 20, Count Palakeo announced in the chamber that three army corps which had coalesced against Bazaine had been thrown into the quarries at jean -Mont. Bravo! Bravo! It is true that no one knew what quarries these were or where they were, nor did anyone explain how they could contain three army corps. But the joyous message went round from mouth to mouth. Have you heard? In the quarries! Oh, yes, of jean -Mont. No one uttered a doubt or question. It was as if everybody had been born at Jamont and knew these army-swallowing quarries as well as his own pocket. About this time, the rumor also prevailed that the king of Prussia had gone mad from despair at the condition of his army. Nothing but monstrous things were heard of. The excitement, the fever of the populace increased hourly. The war at La Baze had ceased to be regarded as an armed promenade, it was felt that the forces which had been let loose were now bringing something terrible on the world. Nothing was spoken of but armies, annihilated, princes driven mad, diabolical hordes, war to the knife. I listened to it thundering and growling. It was the storm of rage and despair that was rising. The battle at Bazai near Metz was described, and it was stated that inhuman cruelties had been committed there by the Bavarians. Do you believe that, I asked Frederick? Do you believe that of the gentle Bavarians? It is quite possible, Bavarian or Turco, German, French or Indian, the warrior who is defending his own life and lifting up his arm to kill another has ceased for the time to be human. What has been awakened in him and stirred up with all possible force is nothing else than bestiality. End of section 73《Section 74 of Lay Down Your Arms》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lay Down Your Arms by Berta von Suttner Translated by Timothy Holmes Chapter 18, Part 2 Metz Fallen the news resounded in the city like some strange and overpowering cry of terror. To me, the news of the taking of a fortress was a message which brought rather a relief, for I thought, well, that is decisive, and it was only for this that the bloody game might be over. It was for this, only this, that I longed. But no, there was nothing decisive in it. More fortresses remained. 
After a defeat, all that is to be done is to pick yourself up again and strike out again at them twice as hard. The chance of arms may change at any time. Ah, yes, the advantage may be now on this side, now on that. It's only woe that is certain, death that is certain to be on both. Trochu felt himself called upon to arouse the spirit of the populace by a new proclamation, and in it appealed to an old motto of Bretagne, with God's help for our fatherland. That did not sound new to me. I had met with something like it before in other proclamations. It did not fail to have its effect. The people were inspirited. Now the thing was to turn Paris into a fortress. Paris, a fortress. I could not take in the idea. The city which Victor Hugo called La Ville Lumière, which is the point of attraction for the whole world of civilization, riches, the pursuit of art, and the enjoyment of life, the point from which radiate splendor, fashions, esprit. This city is now to be fortified, i.e., become the point at which hostile attacks are to be aimed, the target for shot, to close itself against all intercourse and expose itself to the danger of being set in flames by bombardment or starved by famine. And that is done by these people, de gaieté de coeur, in the spirit of self-sacrifice, with joyous emulation, as if it was a question of carrying out the most useful, the most noble work. The work was proceeded with in feverish haste. Ramparts had to be erected on which troops could be placed and shot holes cut in them. Also trenches dug outside the gates, drawbridges erected, covering works repaired, canals bridged over, and protected by breastworks, powder magazines built, and a flotilla of gunboats placed on the Seine. What a fever of activity, what expenditure of exertion and industry, what gigantic expense in labor and money. How exhilarating and ennobling all that would have been if it had been expended on works of public utility, but for the purpose of working mischief, of annihilation, a purpose which is not even one's own, but only a move on the strategic chessboard, it is inconceivable. In order to be able to stand a siege which might possibly be a long one, the city was provisioned. Up to the present time, according to all experience, no such thing as an impregnable fortification has been known. Capitulation is always only a question of time. And yet fortresses have always been erected anew, and provisioned anew with necessaries, in spite of the mathematical impossibility of protecting oneself against the duration of a blockade. The measures taken were on a great scale. Mills were erected and cattle parks laid out, and yet at last the moment must come when the corn will give out and the meat will be consumed. But people do not carry their thoughts so far. By that time the enemy will be driven back over the frontier or annihilated in the country. Now the whole people are joining the army of the fatherland. Everyone offers himself for the service or is pressed into it, and all the firemen in the country were called in to join the garrison of Paris. There might be fires in the provinces, but what of that? Such little accidents disappear when a national disaster is in question. On August 17th, 60,000 firemen had already been enrolled in the capital. The sailors, too, were called in, and new troops of soldiers were formed every day under various names, volontaires, éclaireurs, francs-tireurs. Events followed each other in ever-hastening movement, but now only military events. Everything else was suspended. Nothing else was any more thought of around us except Mauro Prussien. A storm of savage hatred collected. It had not yet broken out, but one heard it rumble. In all official proclamations, in all the street cries, in all public transactions, the conclusion was always Mauro Prussien. All these troops, regular and irregular, these munitions, these workpeople, pressing to the fortifications with their tools and barrows, these transports for weapons, everything that one sees and hears means in its every form and tone, in all its lightning and bluster, in all its flame and rage, mort aux Prussiens. Or, in other words, and then indeed it sounds like a cry of love and warms even the softest hearts, it means pour la patrie, but in essence it is the same. I asked Frederick, you are of Prussian extraction. How does all this unfriendly feeling, which is now finding loud expression, affect you? You said the same to me before in 1866, and I answered you then as I do today, that I suffer from these expressions of hatred not as the subject of any country but as a man. If I judge of the opinions of the people here from a national point of view, I cannot but think them right. They call it la haine sacrée de l'ennemi. And that motive forms an important element in warlike patriotism. 
They are now occupied with this one thought to liberate their country from a hostile invasion. That it is themselves who provoke this invasion by declaring war they have forgotten. Indeed, it was not they who did it, but their government, which they believed on its word, and now they lose no time over reproaches or reflections as to who called down this misfortune on them. It has come, and all their force, all their enthusiasm, must be spent on turning it aside again, or else uniting with unthinking self-sacrifice in a common ruin. Trust me, there is much noble capacity for love in us children of men. The pity only is that we lavish it on the old world tracks of hatred, and on the other side, the hated ones, the invaders, the red-haired eastern barbarians, what are they doing? They were the challenged, and they are pressing forward into the country of those who threatened to overrun theirs. A Berlin! A Berlin! Do not you recollect how this cry kept peeling through the whole city, even down from the roofs of omnibuses? And now these are marching. Nach Paris! Why do the shouters of A Berlin attribute that as a crime to them? Because there cannot be any logic or justice in that national sentiment whose foundation is the assumption that we are ourselves, that is the first, and the others are barbarians. And this forward march of the Germans from victory to victory strikes me with admiration. I have been a soldier also, and I know with what a magical power victory fastens on the mind, what pride, what joy are contained in it. It is in any case the aim, the reward for all the sacrifices made, for the renunciation of rest and happiness, for the risk of life. But then why do not the conquered adversaries, since they too are soldiers and know what fame accompanies victory, why do they not admire their conquerors? Why is it never said in an account of a battle by the losing party, the enemy has obtained a glorious victory? I repeat, because the war spirit and patriotic egotism are the denial of all justice. So it came about, I can see it from all our conversations entered in the Red Books in those days, that we did not and could not think of anything at that time except the result of the present national duel. Our happiness, our poor happiness, we had it, but we dared not enjoy it. Yes, we possessed everything that might have procured for us a heaven of delight on earth. Boundless love, riches, rank, the charming growing boy Rudolf, our heart's idol, Sylvia, independence, ardent interest in the world of mind. But before all this, a curtain had fallen. How dared we? How could we taste of our joys while around us everyone was suffering and trembling, shrieking and raving? It was as if one should set oneself to enjoy oneself heartily on board a storm-tossed vessel. A theatrical fellow, this Trochu, Frederick told me. It was on August 25th. Such a coup de théâtre has been played off today. You will never guess it. A woman called out for military service, I guessed. Well, it does concern the women, but they are not called out. On the contrary. Then are the Suttlers discharged, or the Sisters of Mercy? You have not guessed it yet, either. There's something of dismissal in it, to be sure, and as to Suttlers, too, in the sense that these ladies minister the cup of pleasure, and in the sense the ladies dismissed are merciful, too. But in short, without more riddles, the demi-monde is exiled. And the Minister of War has taken that step? What connection? I cannot see any, either. But the people are in ecstasies over the regulation. In fact, they are always glad when anything happens. From every new order they expect a change, like many sick folks who greet every medicine which is given to them as possibly a panacea. When vice is driven out of the city, so think the pious, who knows whether heaven, now evidently angry, will not again extend its protection over the inhabitants. And now, when people are preparing for the serious time of the siege, with all its privations, what have these silly, wasteful women of pleasure to do here? And so most people, excluding those concerned, think the regulation a proper, moral, and besides a patriotic one, since a great number of these women are foreigners, English, Southerners, nay, even Germans, some of whom may perhaps be spies. No, no, there's only room in the city now for her own children, and only for her virtuous children. On August 28th occurred something still worse, another banishment. All Germans had to quit Paris within three days. The poison, the deadly, long-abiding poison which lay in this regulation, those who wrote the decree possibly had not in any way suspected. The hatred of Germans was awakened by it. For how long a time, even after the war, this misfortune was to go on, bearing its terrible fruit, I know at this day. From that time forward, France and Germany, 
Those two great, flourishing, magnificent countries were no longer two nations whose armies had fought out a chivalrous conflict. Hatred for the whole of the opposed nation pervaded the entire people. Enmity was erected into an institution which was not restricted to the duration of the war, but ensured its continuance as hereditary enmity, even to future generations. Exiled. Obliged to leave the city within three days. I had occasion to see how hardly, how inhumanly hardly, this command pressed on many worthy, harmless families. Among the business people who were supplying us with goods for the decoration of our house, several were Germans, one a carriage builder, one an upholsterer, one an art furniture manufacturer, settled from ten to twenty years in Paris, where they had got their domestic hearth, where they had allied themselves in marriage with Parisians, where they had the whole of their business connection, and now they had to go out, out, in three days, shut up their house, leave all that was dear and familiar to them, lose their fortune, their customers, their inheritance. The poor creatures came running to us in consternation and told us of the misery that had fallen on them. Even the work which they were on the point of delivering to us had to be put aside, and the workshops closed. Wringing their hands and with tears in their eyes, they complained of their sufferings to us. I have an old father, an invalid, said one, and my wife is looking for her confinement any day, and now we must go in three days. I have not a sou in the house, another complained. All my customers who owe me money will be in no hurry to meet their obligations. A week hence I should have completed a large order which would have made me comfortably off, and now I must leave all in confusion. And why? Why was all this misery brought on these poor people? Because they belonged to a nation whose army did its duty successfully, or because, to go further back in the chain of causes, a Hohenzollern might possibly have allowed it to enter into his mind to assume the Spanish throne if offered to him. No, this because, too, has not arrived at the ultimate reason. All this is only the pretext, not the cause of that war. End of section 74. Read by Sandra. Section 75 of Lay Down Your Arms by Berta von Sutner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lay Down Your Arms, translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 18, Part 3 Sida, the Emperor Napoleon has given up his sword. The news overwhelmed us. Now there had really occurred a great unhistorical catastrophe. The French army beaten, its leader checkmated. Then the game was over, won triumphantly by Germany. Over, over, I shouted. If there were people who have the right to call themselves citizens of the world, they might illuminate their windows today. If we had temples of humanity, yet te dames would have to be sung in them on this occasion. The butchery is over. Do not rejoice too soon, my darling, said Frederick in a warning tone. This war has now for some time lost the character of a game fought out on the chessboard of the battlefield. The whole nation is joining in the fight. For one army annihilated, ten others will start out of the earth. But would that be just? It is only German soldiers who have forced themselves into the country, not the German people, and so they ought only to oppose them with French soldiers. How you keep on appealing to justice and reason, you unreasonable creature, in dealing with a madman. France is mad with pain and rage, and from the point of view of loss of country, her pain is pious, her rage justifiable. Whatever desperate thing she may do now is inspired not by personal self-seeking, but by the highest spirit of sacrifice. If only the time were come when the powers of virtue, which is the essential thing that binds men together, were diverted from the work of destruction and devoted to the work of felicity. But this unholy war has again thrown us back a long distance from that goal. No, no, I hope the war is over now. If it were so, and I despair of it, there would be sown the seeds of future wars, and it could only be the seed of hatred which is contained in this expulsion of the Germans. Such a thing as that has an effect far beyond the present generation. 
September 4th, another act of violence, an outbreak of passion, and at the same time a remedy, tried for the salvation of the country. The emperor is deposed. France proclaims herself a republic. Whatever Napoleon III and his army may have done matters not. Mistakes, treachery, cowardice, all these faults have been committed by individuals. The emperor and his generals, but France has not committed them. She's not answerable for it. When the throne was overturned, the leaves in France's history, on which Metz and Sedan were inscribed, were simply torn out of the book. From this time the country itself would carry on the war, if at least Germany dared to continue this infamous invasion. But how, if Napoleon had conquered, I asked, when Frederick communicated this to me? Oh, then France would have taken his victory and his glory as the country's victory and glory. Is that just? Cannot you get out of the habit of putting that question? I had soon to see my hopes that the catastrophe of Sedan would put an end to the campaign vanish. All around us seemed as warlike as ever. The air was laden with savage rage and hot lust of vengeance, rage against the enemy and almost as much against the fallen dynasty. The scandalous talk, the pamphlets which now poured down against the emperor, the empress, and the unfortunate generals, the contempt, the slanders, insults, the jests, it was disgusting. In this way the uncultured masses thought they could lay the whole burden of the defeats of the country on the shoulders of one or two persons, and now that these persons were down, pelted them with dung and stones, and this was the beginning of the time when the country was to show that she was invincible. The preparations for entrenching Paris were carried on zealously. The buildings in the fighting area of the chief enceinte were abandoned or taken down entirely. The suburbs became deserts. Troops of men kept coming from outside into the city with all their belongings. Oh, those sorrowful trains of carts and pack-horses and laden men who were trailing the ruins of their desolated hearths through the streets. I had already seen the same thing once in Bohemia, when the poor country folk were flying from the enemy, and now I had to look on the same picture of wretchedness in the joyous, brilliant capital of the world. There were the same frightened, sorrowful visages, the same weariness and haste, the same woe. At last, God be praised once more a good piece of news. On the proposal of a mediation on the part of England, a meeting was arranged at Ferrières between Jules Favre and Bismarck. Now surely they would succeed in coming to an agreement, in making peace. On the contrary, it was not till now that the extent of the gulf was seen. For some little time before this there had been some talk in the German papers of the annexation of Alsace and Lorraine. A desire was shown to incorporate once more the land which had formerly been German, the historical argument for the claim on these provinces appearing only partially sustainable. The strategic argument was brought forward to support it, indispensable as a fortress in future wars which may be expected. And it is well known, of course, that the strategic grounds are the weightiest, the most impregnable, and that in comparison with them a moral ground can only reckon as secondary. On the other hand, the war game had been lost by France. Was it not fair that the prize should fall to the winners? In case they had won, would not the French have seized the Rhine provinces? If the result of a war is not to have for its consequence an extension of territory for one side or the other, what good would it be to make war at all? Meantime, the victorious army made no halt in its onward march. The Germans were already before the gates of Paris. The cession of Alsace and Lorraine was officially demanded, to which came the well-known reply, quote, Not an inch of our territory, not a stone of our fortresses. Pas un pouce, pas une pierre. Unquote. Yes, yes, thousands of lives, but not an inch of ground. That is the rooted idea of the patriotic spirit. They wish to humble us, cried the French patriots. No, sooner shall exasperated Paris bury itself under its own ruins. Away, away was now our resolution. Why should we stay in a beleaguered foreign city without any necessity? Why live among people full of no other thoughts than those of hate and vengeance, who looked at us with sidelong glances and often with clenched fists when they heard us talking German? It is true we could no longer leave Paris or leave France without difficulty. One had in all directions to pass over war districts. The railway traffic was frequently suspended for private travellers. To leave our new building in the lurch was unpleasant, but this was of no consequence, for our stay was impossible. In fact, we had already stayed far too long. The events which I had experienced recently had shaken me so much that my nerves had suffered grievously from it. I was seized often with shivering, and once or twice also with crying fits. 
Our boxes were already packed and everything prepared for departure when I had another attack and this time so violent that I had to be carried to bed. The physician who was sent for said that either a nervous fever or even an inflammation of the brain was commencing and for the present it was not to be thought of to expose me to the fatigues of travelling. I lay in bed for long, long weeks. Only a very dreamy recollection of that whole time remains with me, and strangely enough, a pleasant recollection. I was, it is true, very ill, and everything in the place where I resided was unceasingly mournful and terrible, and yet when I look back on it, it was a singularly joyful time. Yes, joy, perfectly intense joy, such as children are in the habit of feeling. The cerebral affection which I was suffering, and which brought with it an almost continuous absence, or at least only half presence of consciousness, caused all thoughts and judgments, all reflections and deliberations, to vanish out of my head, and there remained only a vague enjoyment of existence, just like that which children experience, as I said just now, and especially those children who are tenderly watched over. There was no want of tender watching for me. My husband, thoughtful and loving and untiring, was with me day and night. He brought the children also often to my bedside. How much my Rudolf had to tell me. For the most part I did not understand it, but his beloved voice sounded to me like music, and the babbling of our little Sylvia, our heart's idol. How sweetly that began to charm me. Then there were a hundred little jokes and intelligences between Frederick and me about the tricks of our little daughter. What these jokes were about I have quite forgotten, but I know that I laughed and enjoyed myself quite unrestrainedly. Each one of the customary jests seemed to me the height of wit, and the oftener repeated the more witty and more precious, and with what delight did I not swallow the draughts given me, for every day at a given hour I took a glass of lemonade. Such nectar— I have never tasted during my whole life of health, and how entirely refreshing was a medicine with opium in it, whose softly soothing action, putting me into a conscious slumber, sent a thrill of happy calm through my soul. I knew all the while that my beloved husband was by my side, protecting me and watching over me as his heart's dearest treasure. Of the war, which was raging at my door, I had now hardly any cognizance, and if for all that some remembrance of it flashed on me sometimes, I looked on it as something situated as far away and as completely without any concern for me, as if it was being played out in China or on another planet. My world was here, in this sick room, or rather in this chamber of recovery, for I felt myself getting better, and all tended to happiness. End of section 75 Read by Sandra Section 76 of Lay Down Your Arms This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner Translated by Timothy Holmes Chapter 18, Part 4 To happiness? No. With recovery, understanding came back, too, and a perception of the horrors that surrounded us. We were in a beleaguered, famishing, freezing, miserable city. The war was still raging on. The winter had come in the meantime, icy cold. I, now for the first time, learned all that had taken place during my long unconsciousness. The capital of the brotherland, Strasbourg, the lovely, the true German, the city, German to its core, had been bombarded, its library destroyed. 193,722 shots had been poured into the town, four or five a minute. Strasbourg was taken. The country fell into wild despair, such a despair as issues in raving madness. People began to hunt in Nostradamus to find prophecies for the present events, and new seers began to put out fresh predictions. Still worse, possessed folks came forward. It was like falling back into a ghost night of the Middle Ages, lighted by the fire of hell. Oh, that I could be among the Bedouins, cried Gustave Flaubert. Oh, that I could be back in the half-conscious dreamland of my illness, cried I, weeping. I was well again now and had to hear and comprehend all the terrible things that were going on around us. Then began again the entries in the red books, and I have lit on the following notes. December 1st. Trochu has established himself on the heights of Champigny. December 2nd. Obstinate fight around Brie and Champigny. December 5th. The cold is becoming constantly more powerful. 
Oh, the trembling, bleeding, wretched whites who are lying out there in the snow and dying. Even here in the city there's terrible suffering from cold. Business has fallen to nothing. There's no firing to be had. What would not many and one give if there were only two little pieces of wood to be had, even the certainty of the throne of Spain? December 21st. Sorti, out of Paris. December 25th. A small detachment of Prussian cavalry was saluted with musket shot, that is a patriotic duty, from the houses of the village of Trou and Suger. General Kratz commanded the punishment of the villages, that is a commander's duty, and had them burnt. Set them on fire was the word of command, and the men, probably gentle, good-natured fellows, obeyed, that is the soldier's duty, and set fire to them. The flames burst up to heaven, and the poor homesteads fell crashing on man, wife, and child, on flying, weeping, roaring, burning men and beasts. What a joyous, happy, holy Christmas night! Is Paris to be starved out or bombarded as well? Against the last supposition, the civilized conscience revolts. To bombard this ville lumière, this point of attraction of all nations, this brilliant home of the arts, bombard it with its irreplaceable riches and treasures like the first fort that comes to hand. It is not to be thought of. The whole neutral press, as I found out afterwards, protested against it. On the other hand, the press of the war party in Berlin was favorable to it. That would be the only way to bring the war to a close and to conquer the city on the Seine. What glory! Besides, it was just these protests which determined certain circles at Versailles to seize this strategic weapon, and after all, a bombardment is nothing. And so it came about that on December 28th I was writing in shaking characters. Here it is, another heavy stroke, a pause, and again. I wrote no further, but I well remember the feelings of that day. In those words, here it is, there lay, along with the terror, a kind of freedom, a relief, a cessation of the nervous expectation that had by that time become well-nigh insufferable. What one had been for so long partly expecting and fearing, partly thinking hardly humanly possible, is now come. We were sitting at déjeuner à la fourchette, i.e. we were taking bread and coffee. Food was getting scarce already. Frederick, Rudolf, the tutor, and I, when the first stroke resounded, all of us raised our heads and exchanged glances. Is that it? But no, it may have been a house door slamming or something of that sort. Now all was quiet. We resumed the talk that had been interrupted without saying anything about the thought which that sound had caused. Then after two or three minutes it came again. Frederick started up. That is the bombardment, he said, and hurried to the window. I followed him. A hubbub came in from the street. Groups had formed. The people were standing and listening or were exchanging excited words. Now our valet de chambre came rushing into the room and at the same time a fresh salvo resounded. Oh, monsieur et madame, c'est le bombardement. And now all the other men and maids down to the kitchen maid came pushing into the room. In such catastrophes, in the exigencies of war, fire, or water, all distinctions of society fall away, and those threatened all cluster together. All feel equal before danger, much more than before the law, much more than before death, which in its burial ceremonies knows so much of distinction of rank. C'est le bombardement, c'est le bombardement. Everyone who came into the room uttered the same cry. It was horrible, and yet I recollect quite well what I felt. A sort of admiring shudder, a kind of satisfaction at such a mighty experience to be present at a situation so freighted with destiny and not to fear the danger to my own life in it. My pulses beat, and I felt, what shall I call it, the pride of courage. The thing was on the whole less terrible than it had seemed at the first instant. No flaming buildings, no crowds shrieking with terror, no bombshells whizzing continually through the air, but only always this heavy far-off thunder with long and still longer intervals between. One came after a time to get almost accustomed to it. The Parisians chose as objects for a walk those points where the cannon music was best heard. Here and there a bomb would fall in the street and burst, but how rarely did it occur to any given person to happen to be near. It is true that many shells did fall, which carried death. 
but in the city of a million men these cases were heard of in the same scattered way, in which at other times one is accustomed to see in one's newspaper various cases of accident, without its coming specially near to oneself. Quote, a bricklayer fell from a scaffold four stories high, or a genteelly dressed female threw herself over the balustrades of the bridge into the river, unquote, and so forth. The real grief, the real terror of the populace was not for the bombardment, but hunger, cold, and starvation. But one such account of the death-dealing shot gave me a deep shock. It came in the form of a black-bordered morning card sent to the house. Monsieur et Madame R. inform you of the death of their two children, François, aged eight, and Amélie, aged four, who were struck by a bomb coming through the window. Your silent sympathy is requested. Silent sympathy! I gave a loud shriek as I read the paper, a thought, a picture flashing before my inner eye with lightning clearness, showed me the whole of the woe which lay in this simple morning notice. I saw our two children, Rudolph and Sylvia. No, I could not pursue the thought. The tidings which one got were scanty. All communication by post was, of course, cut off. It was by carrier pigeons and balloons only that we had intercourse with the world outside. The rumours that cropped up everywhere were of the most contradictory nature. Victorious sallies were announced, or the information was spread that the enemy was on the point of storming Paris, with a view of setting it on fire in all corners and levelling it to the ground. Or it was asseverated that sooner than allow one German to get within the walls, the commandants of the fort would blow themselves up and the whole of Paris into the air. It was related that the whole population of the country, especially of the south, Le Midi se lève, were falling on the besiegers' rear in order to cut off their retreat and annihilate them to the last man. Along with the false news, some true intelligence also came to us, some whose truth was proved afterwards— such as about a panic that broke out on the road of Grand Luce near Mans, in which horrible deeds took place, soldiers getting beyond control, throwing the wounded out of the railway carriages that were all standing ready, and taking their places themselves. It became more difficult every day to get food. The supply of meat was exhausted. There had for a long time now been no longer any beeves or sheep in the cattle parks that had been formed. All the horses also were soon eaten up, and when the period began, when the dogs and cats, the rats and mice, and finally the beasts in the Jardin des Plantes also, even the poor elephant who was such a favourite had to serve as food, bread could now be hardly procured. The people had to stand in rows for hours after hours in front of the baker's shops in order to get their little ration, and still most of them had to go empty away. Exhaustion and sickness made death's harvest a rich one. Whilst ordinarily eleven hundred died in a week, the death list of Paris in these times rose to between four thousand and five thousand weekly. That is, there were every day between four hundred and five hundred unnatural deaths, that is to say, murders. For if the murderer is not an individual man but an impersonal thing, namely war, it is not any the less murder. Whose is the responsibility? Does it not lie on those parliamentary swaggerers who in their provocative speeches declared with proud self-assumption, as that Girardin did in the sitting of July 15th, that they took on themselves the responsibility for this war in the face of history? Could then any man's shoulders be sufficiently strong to bear such a load of guilt? Certainly not. But no one thinks of taking such boasters at their word. One day, it was about January 20th, Frederick came into my room with an excited look on his return from a walk in the city. Take your diary in hand, my busy little historian, he called out to me. Today a mighty despatch has come, and he threw himself into a chair. Which of my books, I asked. The Protocol of Peace? Frederick shook his head. Oh, that will be out of use for long. The war which is now being fought out is of too powerful a nature not to proceed to its end and give rise to renewed war. On the side of the vanquished it has scattered such a plenty of the seeds of hatred and revenge that a future harvest of war must grow out of them, and on the other side it has brought such magnificent and bewildering successes to the victors that for them an equally great seed-time of warlike pride must grow out of it. 
What, then, has happened of such importance? King William has been proclaimed German Emperor in Versailles. There is now one Germany, one single empire, and a mighty empire, too. That forms a new chapter in what is called the history of the world, and you may think for yourself how, from the birth of this empire, which is the product of war, that trade will be held high in honor. It is, therefore, from this time the two continental states most advanced in civilization, which will chiefly nourish the war spirit, the one in order to return the blow it has received, the other in order to keep the position it has conquered among the powers, from hatred on that side, from love on this, on that side from lust of revenge, on this from gratitude, it comes to the same thing. Shut your protocol of peace. For a long time henceforth, we shall abide under the blood and iron sign of Mars. German Emperor, I cried, that really is grand, and I got him to tell me the particulars of this event. I cannot help, Frederick, I said, being pleased at this news. The whole work of slaughter has not then been for nothing, if a great new empire has grown out of it. But from a French point of view it has been for less than nothing, and we too must have surely the right of looking at this war not from one side, the German side only, not only as men, but even from the narrow national conception we should have the right to bewail the successes of our enemies and conquerors in 1866. However, I agree with you that the union of dismembered Germany, which has now been attained, is a fine thing that this agreement of the rest of the German princes to give the imperial crown to the old victor has something inspiring, something admirable about it. The only pity is that this union did not arise from a peaceful but from a warlike exploit. How was it then that there was not enough love of country, enough popular power in Germany, even though Napoleon III had never sent the challenge of July 19th, to form of their own will that entity on which their national pride is now to rest? one single people of brothers. Now they will be jubilant. The poet's wish is fulfilled. That only four short years ago all were at daggers drawn with each other, that for Hanoverians, Saxons, Frankfurters, Nassars, there was no name more hateful than Prussians, will luckily be forgotten. In place of this, however, the hatred of Germans in this country, how it will ripen from this time. I shuddered. The mere word hatred, I began, is hateful to you? You're right, as long as this feeling is not banished and outlawed, so long is there no humane humanity. Religious hatred is conquered, but national hatred forms still part of civil education. And yet there is only one ennobling, cheering feeling on this earth, and that is love. We could say something about that, Marta, could we not? I leaned my head on his shoulder and looked up at him while he tenderly stroked the hair off my forehead. We know, he went on, how sweet it is that so much love should reside in our hearts for our little ones, for all the brothers and sisters of the great family of man, whom one would so gladly, I so gladly, spare the pain that threatens them. But they will not. No, no, Frederick, my heart is not yet so comprehensive. I cannot love all the haters. You can, however, pity them. And so we talked on a long while in this strain. I still know it all so exactly, because at that time I often, along with the events of the war, entered also fragments of our conversation, which bore upon them into the red volumes. On that day we talked again once more about the future. Paris would now capitulate, the war would be over, and then we could be happy with a safe conscience. Then we recapitulated all the guarantees of our happiness. During the eight years of our married life there had never been a harsh or unfriendly word between us. We had passed through so many sorrows and joys together, and so our love, our unity, was of such a solid kind that no diminution of it was any longer to be feared. On the contrary, we should only be ever more intimately joined together. Every new experience in common would at the same time result in a new tie. When we had become a pair of white-haired old folks— with what joy should we look back on the untroubled past, and what a softly glowing evening of life would then lie before us. This picture of the happy old couple, into which we should then have turned, I have set before myself so often and so livelily, that it became quite clearly stamped on my mind, and even reproduced itself in dreams as if it had really happened, with various details, 
Frederick in a velvet skull cap with a pair of gardening shears. I have no notion why, for he had never shown any love for gardening, and there had yet been no talk of any skull cap. I, with a very coquettishly arranged black lace mantilla over my silvery hair, and as a surrounding for all this a corner of the park, warmly lighted by the setting summer sun, and friendly looks and words smilingly exchanged the while. Do you know now? Do you recollect the time when? Many of the previous pages have I written with shuddering and self-compulsion. It was not without inward horror that I could describe the scenes through which I passed in my journey to Bohemia and the caller a week at Grumitz. I have done it in order to obey my sense of duty. Beloved lips once gave me the solemn command, In case I die before you, you must take my task in hand and labor for the work of peace. If this binding injunction had not been laid on me, I could never have so far prevailed over myself as to tear open the agonized wounds of my reminiscences so unsparingly. Now, however, I have come to an event which I will relate, but which I will not, nor can I, describe. No, I cannot. I cannot. I have tried ten half-written torn pages are lying on the floor by the side of my writing table, but a heart pang seized me, my thoughts froze up or got into wild entanglement in my brain, and I had to throw the pen aside and weep bitter, hot tears with cries like a child. Now, a few hours afterwards, I resume my pen, but as to describing the particulars of the next event, as to relating what I felt when it happened, I must give that up. The thing itself is sufficient. Frederick, my own one, was in consequence of a letter from Berlin that was found in his house, suspected of espionage, was surrounded by a mob of fanatics crying, A mort! A mort! Le Prussien! dragged before a tribunal of patriots, and on February 1st, 1871, shot by order of a court martial. End of chapter 18. Read by Sandra. Section 77 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philip Erickson, Okemos, Michigan. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 19, Part 1. Chapter 19. Serious mental illness consequent on my husband's death. This recurs occasionally. Conclusion of my diary, additions to the Protocol of Peace, Progress of the Peace Movement, Mr. Hodgson Pratt's letter, The Emperor Frederick's Manifesto, I write the last word of my autobiography, my grandson's christening, my daughter's engagement, Rudolph's speech at the christening, Hail to the Future, Finis. When for the first time I came to myself again, peace had been concluded and the commune was over. I had been in bed for a month ill nursed by my faithful Mrs. Anna, without any consciousness of being alive. And what the illness was, I know not, to the present day. The people about me called it considerately typhus, but I believe that it was simply madness. So much I darkly recall that the last interval had been filled with imaginations of crackling shots and blazing conflagrations, probably the events which were spoken of in my presence, mingled in my fantasy with the truth, the battles, that is, between the Versailles and the Communards, and the incendiary fires of the Petrolius's. That, when I recovered my reason, and with it the knowledge of my deep misery, I did not do myself some harm, or the pang did not kill me, probably was due to my possession of my children. Through them I could, for them I was forced, to live. Even before my illness, on the very day when that terrible thing broke over me, Rudolph kept me alive. I was shrieking aloud, on my knees, while I repeated, Die! Die! I must die! Then two arms embraced me, and a praying, painfully solemn, lovely boy's face was looking at me. Mother! Up to that time I had never been called by my boy anything but Mama. His using at this moment, for the first time, the word Mother said to me in those two syllables, You are not alone. You have a son who shares your pain, who loves and honors you above all things, who has no one in this world except you. Do not abandon your child, mother. I pressed the dear creature to my heart, 
and to show him that I had understood him, I too faltered out, My son, my son. At the same time I recollected my girl, his girl, and my resolution to live was fixed. But the pain was too intolerable. I fell into intellectual darkness. And not at this time only. For the space of years, at ever-increasing intervals, I remained subject to recurring attacks of abstraction, of which afterwards, in the state of health, absolutely no recollection remained to me. Now, for several years, I have been free from them. Free, that is, from the insensibility of my spirit pangs, but not from conscious attacks of the bitterest pain of soul. Eighteen years have gone since the 1st of February, 1871, but the deep resentment and the deep mourning, which the tragedy of that day awoke in me, no time can remove, even should I live a hundred years. Even though in these later times the days come ever more frequently in which I, absorbed in the events of the present, do not think about the misery of the past, in which I even sympathize so livelily with the joy of my children as to feel myself also filled with something like joy in my life, yet no night passes, no not one, in which my wretchedness does not seize on me. That is something quite peculiar, something I can hardly describe, and which only those will understand who have experienced something similar themselves. It appears to me like a kind of double life of the soul, although the single consciousness in the waking condition can sometimes be so taken possession of by the things of the outer world that it from time to time forgets, yet in the depths of my personality there is a second consciousness, still which always retains that awful recollection with the same true pain, and that self, when the other has gone to sleep, asserts itself, and rouses the other up, as it were, to share its pain with it. Every night, and it must be at the same hour, I wake with an indescribable feeling of pain. My heart contracts painfully, and I feel as if forced to weep bitter tears and utter sighs of agony. This lasts a few seconds, without my awakened self quite knowing why the other unhappy self is so unhappy. The next stage after this is a compassion embracing the whole world, and a sigh, full of the most painful pity. Oh, you poor, poor men! And then I see next shrieking shapes, which are being torn to pieces by a rain of murderous shot. And then I recollect that my dearest love, too, was so torn in pieces. But in my dreams, wonderful to relate, I never knew anything of my loss. Thus it happened often that I was speaking to Frederick and conversing with him as during his life. Whole scenes from the past were represented, but never any sad ones. Our meeting again after Slushy Kolstein, our jokes over Sylvia's cradle, our walking tours in Switzerland, our hours of study over favorite books, and occasionally that same picture in the evening light, where my white-haired husband with his garden shears was pruning the rose branches, and was saying with a smile to me, Are we not a happy old couple? I have never put off my mourning, not even at my son's wedding. When any one has loved, possessed, and lost such a husband, and lost him as I did, her love must be stronger than death. Her passion for vengeance can never cool. But whom does this anger threaten? On whom would I execute vengeance? The men who did the deed were not in fault. The only guilty party is the spirit of war. And it is on this that my work of persecution, all too weak as it is, must be exercised. My son Rudolf agrees with my views, though this, of course, does not prevent him from going through his military exercises every year, and could not prevent him either from marching to the frontier, if the European war, which is always hanging over our heads, should break out. And then, perhaps, I shall have once more to see how all that is dearest to me in the world has to be sacrificed on the altar of Moloch, how a hearth blessed with love, and which is the sign to my old age of all its rest and peace, has to be laid in ruins. Shall I have to see all this once more, and then once more to fall into irrevocable madness, or shall I yet behold the triumph of justice and humanity, which now, at this very moment, is striving for accomplishment in widely extended associations and in all strata of society. The red volumes, my diary, contain no further entries. Under the date February 1st, 1871, I marked a great cross, and so closed the history of my life also. Only the so-called protocol, a blue volume which Frederick began along with me, and in which we described the phases of the idea of peace, has been since that time enriched with a few notes. In the first years which succeeded the Franco-German War, I had few opportunities, even apart from my diseased condition of mind, for making any tidings of peace. The two most influential nations on the continent were reveling in thoughts of war. 
the one proudly looking back on the victory she had gained, the other longingly expecting her impending revenge. The current of these feelings gradually began to subside. On this side of the Rhine, the statues of Germania were a little less shouted over, and on that side those of Strasbourg decked with fewer mourning wreaths. Then, after ten years, the voice of the servants of peace might again be heard. It was Blunchley, the great professor of international law, the same with whom my lost one had put himself in communication, who set to work to obtain the views of various dignitaries and governments on the subject of national peace. And then the silent thinker out of battles let fall the well-known expression. Everlasting peace is a dream, and not a pretty dream either. Oh, of course, I wrote at the time in my blue book, beside Mulk his words, if Luther had asked the Pope what he thought of the revolt from Rome, the answer he would have received would not have been very favorable to the Reformation. Today there is hardly anyone left who has not dreamed this dream, or who would not confess its beauty. And there are watchers, too, watchers conspicuous enough, who are longing to awake mankind out of the long sleep of savagery, and energetically, and with a single eye to their object, collecting themselves for the purpose of planting the white flag. Their battle cry is war on war. Their watchword, the only word which can have power to deliver from ruin Europe armed against herself, is lay down your arms. In all places, in England and France, in Italy, in the northern countries, in Germany, in Switzerland and America, associations have been formed whose object is, through the compulsion of public opinion, through the commanding pressure of the people's will, to move the governments to submit their differences in future to an arbitration court, appointed by themselves and so once for all to enthrone justice in place of brute force. That this is no dream, no enthusiasm, is proved by the facts that the questions of the Alabama, the Caroline Islands, and several others have already been settled in this manner, and it is not only people without power or position, like the poor blacksmith of a former time, who are now cooperating in this work of peace. No members of parliament, bishops, professors, senators, ministers, are inscribed on the lists. I know all this, which is unknown to most people, because I have kept in communication with all those persons with whom Frederick established relations in the pursuit of his noble aim. What I found out, by means of these persons, about the successes and the designs of the peace societies, has been duly entered in the Protocol of Peace. The last of these entries is the following letter, which the President of the International Arbitration and Peace Association, having its headquarters in London, wrote me an answer to an inquiry bearing on this subject. International Arbitration and Peace Association, London, 41 Outer Temple, July, 1889. Madam, you have honored me by inquiring as to the actual position of the great question to which you have devoted your life. Here is my answer. At no time, perhaps, in the history of the world has the cause of peace and goodwill been more hopeful. It seems that, at last, the long night of death and destruction will pass away, and we who are on the mountain top of humanity think that we see the first streaks of the dawn of the kingdom of heaven upon earth. It may seem strange that we should say this at a moment when the world has never seen so many armed men and such frightful engines of destruction ready for their accursed work, but when things are at their worst, they begin to mend. Indeed, the very ruin which these armies are bringing in their train produces universal consternation and soon the oppressed peoples must rise, and with one voice say to their rulers, Save us, and save our children from the famine which awaits us. If these things continue, save civilization, and all the triumphs which the efforts of wise and great men have accomplished in its name. Save the world from a return to barbarism, rapine, and terror. What indications, do you ask, are there of such a dawn of a better day? Well, let me ask in reply, is not the recent meeting at Paris of the representatives of 100 societies for the declaration of international concord, for the substitution of a state of law and justice, for that of force and wrong, an event unparalleled in history? Have we not seen men of many nations assembled on this occasion and elaborating, with enthusiasm and unanimity, practical schemes for this great end? Have we not seen, for the first time in history, a Congress of representatives of the parliaments of free nations declaring in favor of treaties being signed by all civilized states, whereby they shall bind themselves to defer their differences to the arbitrament of equity, pronounced by an authorized tribunal, instead of a resort to wholesale murder? 
Moreover, these representatives have pledged themselves to meet every year in some city of Europe, in order to consider every case of misunderstanding or conflict, and to exercise their influence upon governments in the cause of just and pacific settlements. Surely, the most hopeless pessimist must admit that these are signs of a future when war shall be regarded as the most foolish and most criminal blot upon man's record. Dear Madam, accept the expression of my profound esteem. Yours truly, Hodgson Pratt. There is also to be found in the Blue Book the Manifesto of a Prince, dated March 1888, a manifesto from which at last, breaking with old usage, instead of a warlike, a peaceful spirit shines forth. But the noble one, who left these words to his people, the dying one, who with the last effort of his strength grasped the scepter, which he would have swayed as if it had been a palm branch, remained helplessly chained to his bed of pain, and after a short interval all was over. End of section 77. Recording by Philip Erickson, Okemos, Michigan. Section 78 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philip Erickson, Okemos, Michigan. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 19, Part 2. Mother, will you not put your morning off for the day after tomorrow? Rudolph came into my room with these words today for the christening of his first-born son is fixed for the day after tomorrow. No, my dear, I replied. But think, at such a festival you surely will not be mournful. Why then keep the outer signs of mourning? And you will not be superstitious, and fear that the black dress of the grandmother will bring bad luck to the child? Oh, no. But it does not harmonize with the surrounding gaiety. Have you then sworn an oath? No, it is only a firm resolution. But a resolution linked to such a memory, you know my meaning, that it partakes of the inviolability of an oath. My son bowed his head, and did not urge me further. I have interrupted you in what you are about. You were writing? Yes, my autobiography. God be praised, it is at an end. That was the last chapter. But how can you bring your history to an end? For you are still alive, and will live many years yet, many happy years, amongst us, mother. Surely with the birth of my little Frederick, whom I will bring up to adore his grandmamma, a new chapter must be opening for you. You are a good child, dear Rudolph. I should be unthankful if I did not take pride and joy in you, and just as much joy as my, and his, beautiful Sylvia give me. Oh yes, I am reserved for a blessed old age, a quiet evening, but still the history of the day is over when the sun has set, is it not? He concurred with a silent look of compassion. Yes, the word finis at the end of my biography is correct. When I made the resolve to write it, I also determined to break off at February 1st, 1871. Only in the case of your being torn from me also by war, which might indeed so easily have happened. But by good luck you are not of age for service at the time of the Bosnian campaign. Only in that case would I have been forced to prolong my book. Still, even as it is, it was pain enough to write it. And possibly, too, it may be painful to read it, remarked Rudolph, turning over the leaves of the MS. I hope so. If that pain should only awaken a few hearts an energetic hatred against the source of all the misery here described, I shall not have put myself to the torture in vain. Do you not fear one thing? Its purpose may be seen, and people so be put out of humor with it. That can only happen with a purpose which is perceived, but which the author has tried cunningly to conceal. Mine, however, lies exposed to the light. It is announced in plain words at the first glance on the title page. July 1889 the christening came off yesterday. It was turned into a festival promising twofold happiness, for my daughter Sylvia, the godmother of her little nephew, and his godfather, whom we had long cherished secretly in our hearts, Count Anton Delnitsky, took this opportunity to announce their engagement. And thus I am surrounded on all hands with happy relations, by means of my children. Rudolph, who has six years since come into possession of the Dotsky estate, and has been for four years married to Beatrix Ney Griesbeck, who had been intended for him since childhood, the most lovely creature that can be imagined, sees now his most ardent wish fulfilled by the birth of an heir. In short, an enviable, brilliant destiny. The christening guests assembled at a dinner in the summer house. The glass doors were left open, and the air of the summer noon streamed in, laden with the scent of the roses. Next me in our circle sat Countess Laurie Griesbeck, Beatrix's mother, 
She was now a widow. Her husband fell in the Bosnian expedition. She did not take her loss very deeply to heart. In no case would she wear continual mourning. On the contrary, this time she had put on garnet-red brocade with brilliant jewels. She had remained just as superficial as she was in her youth. Questions of toilette, one or two fashionable French or English romances, and society chatter, that was always sufficient to fill her horizon. Even coquetting she had not entirely given up. She no longer had designs on young folks, but older personages, endowed with high rank or high position, were not safe from her appetite for conquest. At this time, as it seemed to me, minister to be sure was her mark. The latter had, besides, changed his name. And so we called him now minister to other side, from his new catchword. I must make a confession to you, Lori said to me as I clinked my glass with hers to the health of the baby. On this solemn occasion, when we have been christening the grandson of each of us, I must unburden my conscience before you. I was quite seriously in love with your husband. That you have often confessed to me, dear Lori. But he always remained quite indifferent. That, too, I knew. Well, you had a husband true as steel, Martha. I could not say as much for mine. But none the less for that, I was very sorry about Griesbeck. Well, he died a glorious death, that is one comfort. A widow's life is truly a tedious one, especially as one grows older. As long as there are treats and people to pay court to you, widowhood is not devoid of. But now I assure you, one is quite melancholy all alone. With you, the case is rather different. You live with your son, but I am not at all anxious to live with Beatrix. And she, too, is not anxious for it. The mother-in-law in the house does not do well. For, after all, one likes to be mistress at home. Servants certainly are a plague. That is very true. Still, one can at least give them their orders. You will hardly believe me, but I should not feel very much averse to marrying again. A marriage of reason, of course. And with some sedate minister or something of that sort, I interposed, smiling. Oh, you sly creature. You have seen through me again. But just look there. Do you not notice how Tony Delnitsky is talking to your Sylvia? It is really quite compromising. Don't trouble yourself. Godfather and Godmother made it up between them on their way from church. Sylvia has confided it to me. Tomorrow the young man will come to me to ask her hand. What do you say? Well, you are to be congratulated. The handsome Tony may no doubt have been a little gay from time to time, but they are all that. That cannot be otherwise, and when one thinks what a good match... My Sylvia has never thought of that. She loves him. Well, so much the better. That is a fine addition to a wedding. An addition? It is all in all. One of the guests, an imperial and royal colonel on the retired list, tapped his glass and, oh dear, a toast, most of them probably thought, as they broke off their separate talk, and sighing, set themselves to listen to the speaker, and it was something to sigh for. The unhappy man stuck in his speech three times, and his choice of a wish to offer us was not less unfortunate. The infant was congratulated on being born at a time when the country was about soon to employ the services of her sons, and may he one day use his sword gloriously, as his maternal great-grandfather and as his paternal grandfather did, and may he himself bring up many sons who in their turn may do honor to their father and their ancestors, and like so many of those who have fallen, their ancestors, ancestors for the honor of the land of their ancestors, their ancestors and the ancestors of their ancestors, conquer or in a word, the health of Frederick Dotsky. The glasses clinked, but the speech had not warmed us. That this being only just come into life should already be entered on the death roll of future battles did not make a pleasant impression on us. To drive away this painful picture, one of those present felt prompted to hazard the comforting remark that present conjectures guaranteed a long peace, that the Triple Alliance, on this general conversation, was luckily brought back to the domain of politics and minister to other side, took the word. In reality, Lori Griesbeck was hanging on his words, it is clear that the defensive power which we have attained is something tremendous, and must deter all peace-breakers. The law of the Landstrom, which binds all citizens fit for service from nineteen to forty-two years of age, and those who have been officers even up to sixty years to military service, enables us at the first summons to put four million eight hundred thousand soldiers in the field at once. On the other side, it is not to be denied that the increased demands which are contemplated by the war ministry press heavily on the people, and that the measures necessitated by these demands to secure the necessary readiness of the country for war act in the opposite way on the regulation of the finances. 
but on the other side, it is exhilarating to see with what joyful self-sacrificing patriotism the representatives of the people always and in all places vote the increased burdens which the Ministry of War demands. They recognize the necessity admitted by all enlightened politicians and conditioned by the increase in the defensive forces of the neighboring states and by the political situation for subordinating all other considerations to the iron compulsion of military development. A live leading article, said someone half aloud. T'other side, however, went on. And all the more, because it is in this way that a security will undoubtedly be taken for the maintenance of peace. For while we, in obedience to traditional patriotism, emulate the steady increase of the defensive power of our neighbors in order to secure our own borders, we are fulfilling an exalted duty, and are in hopes to banish also far away all the dangers which may threaten us from any side. And therefore I raise my glass in honor of that principle which, as I know, is so dear to the heart of our friend, the Baroness Martha, a principle which the signatories of the League of Peace of Central Europe also prize highly. And I ask you to join with me in drinking. Long live peace, and may its blessings be right long preserved to us. I will not drink to that, I said. An armed peace is no benefit, and war ought to be avoided. Not for a long time, but forever. If one were making a sea voyage, the assurance would not suffice that it would be right long before the ship struck on a rock. The honorable captain should aim at this, that the whole voyage shall be got over prosperously. Dr. Bresser, who is still our best home friend, came to my aid. In reality, Your Excellence, can you trust to the honest and sincere desire for peace of men who are soldiers from passionate enthusiasm, who will not hear of anything which endangers war, viz. disarmaments, leagues of states, arbitration courts? And could the delight in arsenals and fortresses and maneuvers and so forth persist if these things were looked on merely as what they are held out as being, mere scarecrows? so that the whole money expended on their erection is spent only in order that they may never be used. The peoples are to be obliged to give up all their money to make fortifications on their frontiers with a view of kissing hands to each other across those frontiers. The army is thus to be brought down to the level of a mere gendarmerie for the maintenance of peace, and the most exalted warlord is to preside merely over a crowd of perpetual shunners of war. No, behind this mask, the civis pacem mask, glances of understanding wink at each other, and the deputies who vote every war budget wink at the same time. The representatives of the people, broke in the minister, surely the spirit of sacrifice is worthy of nothing but praise, which in threatening seasons they never fail to show, and which finds cheering expression in the unanimous acceptance of the appropriate laws. Forgive me, Your Excellence, I should like to call out to those unanimous voters, one after the other. Your yes will rob that mother of her only child. Yours will put that poor fellow's eyes out. Yours will set fire to a collection of books which cannot be replaced. Yours will dash out the brains of a poet who would have been the glory of your country. But you have all voted yes to this, just in order not to appear cowards, as if the only thing one had to fear in giving assent was what regards oneself. Is then human egotism so great that this is the only motive which can be suggested for opposing war? Well, I grant you egotism is great, for each one of you prefers to hound on a hundred thousand men to destruction rather than that you should expose your dear self even to the suspicion of having ever experienced one single paroxysm of fear. I hope, my good doctor, said the colonel dryly, that you may never become a deputy. The whole house would hiss you down. Well, to expose myself to the risk of that would suffice for a proof that I am not a coward. It is swimming against the stream which requires the strength of steel. But suppose the moment of danger should come, and we should be found unprepared. Let such a condition of justice be instituted as would make the occurrence of the moment of danger an impossibility. For what such a moment might be, Colonel, no one can at present form any clear conception. With the dreadfulness of the science of warlike implements which we have already attained, and which is constantly advancing, with the enormous proportions of the powers engaged in the contest, the next war will in reality be no mere moment of danger. But there is really no word for it, a time of gigantic misery, aid and nursing out of the question, sanitary reforms and the arrangements for provisioning will appear as mere irony in face of the demands upon them. The next war, about which people talk so glibly and so indifferently, will not be a gain for one side and loss for the other, but ruin for all. Who amongst us here votes for this moment of danger? Not I, to be sure, said the minister, and not you either, dear doctor, but men in general 
and not our government. I will be surety for them, but the other states. What right have you to think other men worse and more unreasonable than you or I? Now I will tell you a little story. Before the closed gate of a beautiful garden stood a crowd of men, one thousand and one in number, looking in very longingly. The gatekeeper had orders to let the people in, in case the majority among them wished for admission. He called one of them to him. Tell me, only speak honestly, do you wish to come in? Oh yes, to be sure I do, but the other thousand I am certain do not. The careful gatekeeper wrote this answer in his notebook. Then he called up a second. He said the same. Again, the other entered in the yes column, the number one, and in the no column, the number one thousand. And so it went on up to the last man. Then he added up the figures. The result was one thousand and one yes over a million no. So the gate remained shut, for the no's had a crushing majority, and that proceeded from the fact that every one considered himself obliged to answer for the others too, instead of for himself only. To be sure, began the minister thoughtfully, and again Laurie Greisbeck turned her eyes on him with admiration. To be sure, it would be a fine thing if a unanimous vote in favor of laying down one's arms could be brought about. But on the other side, what government would dare to make the beginning? To be sure, there is nothing so desirable as concord. But, on the other side, how can lasting concord be thought possible so long as human passions, separate interests, and so forth still continue? I beg your pardon, said my son Rudolph, now taking the word. Forty millions of inhabitants in a state form one whole. Then why not several hundred millions? Can this be susceptible of logical and mathematical proof that so long as human passions, separate interests, and so forth still continue, it is indeed possible for forty millions of people to renounce the right to go to war with each other about them, Nay, three states, like the present Triple Alliance, may ally themselves together and form a league of peace, but five states cannot do it, and must not do it? Truly, truly, our world of today gives itself out as wondrous wise, and laughs at the savages, and yet in many things we also cannot count up to five. Some voices made themselves heard. What? Savages? That about us? With our over-refined culture? At the end of the nineteenth century? Rudolph stood up. Yes, savages. I will not recall the word. And so long as we cling to the past, we shall remain savages. But we are already standing at the gate of a new period. Glances are directed forwards. All are pressing on strongly towards another, a higher form. Savagery with its idols and its weapons. There are many who are already edging away gradually from it. If even we may be nearer to barbarism than most people believe, we are also perhaps nearer to our ennoblement than most people hope. The prince or statesman is perhaps already alive who is to bring to perfection the exploit which will live in all future history as the most glorious and enlightened of all exploits, that which will carry universal disarmament. We have placed our feet already on the threshold of an age in which manhood is to raise itself into humanity, to the nobility of humanity, as Frederick Tilling used to say. Mother, I drink this glass now to the memory of your unforgotten, loved, and trusted one, to whom I too owe everything all I think and all I am. And from that glass, and he threw it against the wall where it shattered to pieces, shall no other drop ever be drunk again. And today, at my newborn child's christening, shall no other toast be proposed than this. Hail to the future. To fulfill its task, shall we clothe ourselves in steel? No. Shall we endeavor to show ourselves worthy of our father's fathers, as the old phrase goes? No. But of our grandson's grandson's. Mother, said he, breaking off, you are weeping. What is the matter with you? What do you see there? My gaze had been directed to the open glass door. The rays of the setting sun had thrown a halo of tremulous gold round a rose bush, and from this, rising up in lifelike clearness, was my dream picture. I saw the garden shears glitter, the white hair shine. He smiled at me as he said, Are we not a happy old couple? Ah, woe is me. Finis. End of section 78. Recording by Philip Erickson, Okemos, Michigan. End of Lay Down Your Arms, the autobiography of Martha Von Tilling by Bertha Von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes.